What do we want to talk about? I am him! I am him! Hey, hey, this the red carpet ring. Featuring TBK, the turnbuckle king himself. We are back at it again with the brand new audiobook. Becky Lynch, the man, not your average, average girl audio for 2024. Sorry for the late, guys. We are in. This is the final part of the audiobook. Final part. I know I gave you, I know it's been a few days since we've been here, but you know. Been busy Easter Sunday weekend, and I want to provide you guys the last part of this audiobook. We are having two hours and 50 minutes left of this audiobook, and we're getting into the real nitty gritty of Becky Lynch's career, her professional wrestling career, you know, as she um, goes on with it. Let's see who comes to the ring. Really honest, good bread. Thanks for coming out. We got Carl Myers. I got to get you a wrench, my brother, for here, Red Carpet Ring and Toss Ring Scandal. You have not been ignored. I got you. I know you've been recently using this account over the CeeLo Myers account, but thank you for your support. You've been here since day one. You've been here since day uno, and I thank you for that. Uh, really honest. Thanks for coming out. But anyway, um, I want to give you guys this audiobook of Becky Lynch. Um, this has been a very good audiobook. She's been doing recently doing interviews of this audiobook. And um I know it's been very, very, very uh good for her doing this book. And I want I want to, like I said, cover this audiobook. And you know, it's been very, very good. Um, I know there's another audiobook coming out, and I heard that um some of the people at the um have been asking for this book. And that's the that is currently the Ronda Rousey book. So definitely I'm going to look into that and also provide that audiobook as well. But with that being said. We are going to get into the audiobook as you come into the ring. Like, subscribe, keep the notification bell on. And I believe we're on episode nine. It's where we left off. I know I had chapters in there. I know she go by episode. But I'm going to try to keep up with the bookmarks and the, you know, keep that on the screen. But you know, I try to not talk so much and let it focus on Becky Lynch. So let's see if we can get into that. Of getting her book on, on, and with that being said, let's cover that book. Let's cover that book of what she's been doing. You know, she's been uh, been doing very good, very good audio book. Something definitely not to ignore. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Like I said, it's been. You guys, let me know what you think of the audio book afterwards. She has been she's been doing her thing. And much credit to Becky Lynch. Thanks. Uh, great story. She may not be my favorite wrestler, but she has been doing a good story. But enough of what I have to say. Let's cover Becky Lynch. The audiobook. The man. And this is the final part, you guys. We are almost at the finish line. Thank you all for your support from the beginning, middle, and currently. So let's get into it. frankly shit we had our match in dallas the same place where i'd had my big wrestlemania seat as a car sped by mania i felt like i had won wham another car whizzed by and we were hit from the side 
A car swerved as I tried to control the steering wheel. My mind was having a hard time registering what was happening, but I was in because we hadn't had much time to practice. Episode 9. Get your shit in. Holy shit, that could have killed us! I gasped to Charlotte, who was sitting in the passenger seat as a car sped by us near the exit to 8 Mile in Detroit. Wham! Another car whizzed by and we were hit from the side. A car swerved as I tried to control the steering wheel. My mind was having a hard time registering what was happening, but I was 99% sure we were going to die as I prayed I wasn't veering into any passing semi-trucks. We jolted from side to side, possibly hitting cars, possibly hitting walls. It was too much of a blur. We finally crashed hard against the center wall in the highway. The windscreen was completely smashed, the airbags inflated. I couldn't see out the window or where we landed. We could still be in danger. I looked over at Charlotte and saw a stream of bright red falling down her forehead. My heart was in my mouth as I feared the worst. Are you okay? Three seconds felt like an eternity until she responded. Yeah, are you? She said as she picked the red line off her head and looked at it, disgusted. It was a red pepper from a pre-packaged meal in the back that had gone flying. Phew. She had just moved from Raw to SmackDown, and this was a horrible way to begin the Thelma and Louise reunion tour. We cautiously got out of the car, which had now turned into a mound of smoke. Stepping out onto the grassy patch in between an exit and the highway, we quickly moved away from the vehicle, terrified it could explode at any minute. After trying to wave down passers-by to help us, with no luck whatsoever, I apprehensively approached the wreck, climbing inside to retrieve our phones to call for help. The police came quickly. We hadn't been the only ones who got hit, though the other wrecks were nowhere to be seen. You could only see flares shimmering in the dark, smoky night some distance away. We really had gone adrift. We rejected being checked out by paramedics, though I was almost certainly concussed and my wrist had been jacked up by being jammed in the steering wheel. Charlotte is akin to the Terminator. You can't injure that woman. The police offered to drive us to our hotel, so I got to ride in the back of a police car for the first time in my life. Sitting on the hard plastic, which had clearly not been designed for comfort, I thought of how close that could have been to the end. That could have been my last breath, my last show. And would I be happy with how I had lived? I waited for some sort of beaming light to come down from the heavens, telling me that I was doing it all wrong and needed to denounce my life and go live in an ashram in India. Certainly get out of the dead-end relationship I was in. It never came. Charlotte and I still made it to the rest of the shows that weekend, though we were certainly traumatized. For the next little while, I was terrified to drive anywhere, suspicious of every driver who passed me. Sure, I was only moments away from certain death any time I was behind the wheel. I called my dad, the best driver I knew, as if he could give me some reassurance. But there was nothing he could do. Getting anywhere was going to be tough for the next while, both physically and metaphorically. I'd been with the nice boy for over a year now and I would lie awake with the sense of dread that I was wasting my prime years with someone I knew wasn't right for me. We had even moved into a new apartment in Los Angeles as if that would help things. It only seemed to make things worse. With Charlotte back on SmackDown, she was now the priority and I was moved to the back burner. Obviously, it wasn't her fault and I never held any resentment towards her in real life for that. But I felt like my career had come to a standstill. I was even left off SummerSlam that year. But I was still brought to New York for the odd appearance and would have to watch the event as a fan. The night before the big pay-per-view, I went down to collect some shoes that my friend and trainer, Joshy G, had given Colby to give me. I knocked on the door of Colby's Holiday Inn hotel room. He opened the door looking sleepy, box in hand. Thanks, Colby. No problem. Are you ready for tomorrow? I asked. Yeah, I guess so. How are you doing? I'm okay. 
I lied as the tears built up in my eyes. What's wrong, he said, startled by this emotional outburst over such a benign question. The tears were now streaming down my face, impossible to stop. Come in, come in, you can't be crying in the hallway. He ushered me into his cramped hotel room, quickly clearing off the clothes on his bed to make space for me. Sit down here, he said kindly as he stood, not wanting to crowd me. What's going on? It's everything, I blubbered as I went into the problems of my relationship. I like the guy as a friend, but I'm not happy. But I'm also not brave enough to end it because I'm an insecure coward. He listened, knowing there wasn't really any advice he could give me if I wasn't ready to end it. And I just don't know what to do with work. I feel like every time I gain momentum, it just gets shut down. They'll either take me off TV or I'm pushed aside for whoever else they want. I don't know what to do, I continued through my sobs. This was his area of expertise, what with being the world's best wrestler and all. Man, it's tough. How are you at getting your shit in? Not good, I admitted. You gotta get your shit in, dog, he said in the cool way he says things. I don't know how. You know who you should look at? Who? I asked. Daniel Bryan. Does he always get his shit in? So when I say that, I mean moments. It's not that he has to do a shit ton of moves or anything, but he carves out moments for himself or will have a way of selling that gets him more over. Look for those opportunities, he advised. I'd stopped blubbering. It's all going to be okay, he reassured me. How do you know? Because it always is in the end. And if it's not okay, that's okay too. Thanks, buddy. You're the best. He gave me a big comforting hug before I went back to my room, feeling a bit more uplifted and grateful I had a friend like him. That was the kind of guy I needed to date. I just didn't think there were too many Colbys in the world, so I stayed stuck in my ruddy relationship. Episode 10 The Heartbreak Kid I was about to get a break away from wrestling, which felt very needed. Not because my body was hurting, but in a world that's so competitive without being an actual competition, a bit of space to garner perspective can be helpful. At the same time, it wasn't lost on me how much the business had changed since we got here. That was what I wanted to do, right? Create a more equal space? In a matter of years, we had made sure women were positioned in a favorable spot. I had already made history more times than I could count. I had been involved in the first ever women's ladder match, and the first time women had main evented SmackDown in a cage match. I had been in the first ever tables match for a women's title. I had competed in the first intergender match in a decade. Anytime I got the chance to tell a story, I could make people care. Wasn't that victory in itself? It was. But I wanted all the superficial shit that equated success, not the internal satisfaction of fulfillment that comes from knowing you were doing a good job and creating change. No, I wanted to be on the posters, the DVDs, the billboards. I wanted to main event WrestleMania and it looked no closer in sight than trying to get a glimpse of the ancient pyramids from the Emerald Isle. Impossible. My brain was going to get to focus on something else for a month. I had been cast in one of WWE's franchise films, The Marine Six. They're low budget, cheesy action movies, but I was elated to get a chance to show off my acting chops, take a few steps away from the ring and garner a new approach. It helped that I was starring alongside the legend that is Shawn Michaels, one of the greatest to ever lace up a pair of boots. As we drove to and from the set together, I took every second to pick his brain, wishing for red lights and traffic jams so I might pick up a thing or two. His raspy voice detailed his trials and tribulations and lessons he learned along the way. He told me about how he had found the character of the heartbreak kid, admitting he didn't always feel confident, but could live vicariously through the character. I listened, my mind boggled that even Shawn Michaels didn't always feel confident. To me, he was the living embodiment of confidence. 
Maybe everyone feels like this. Maybe I wasn't so out of place. Maybe we're all battling those demons that tell us we're not good enough. But what about wrestling? Did you ever struggle with anything in the ring? I asked, hopeful we could find more common ground. Nothing really. It always came quite easy for me. Ah, fuck, I thought. Well, that I can't relate to. It had always been a struggle for me. So maybe I wasn't going to be the next Shawn Michaels in the ring. But I didn't have to be. I just needed to be able to tell a story and connect with the crowd. How do I change things, though? I feel like I'm in such a rut. What can I do when I go back? I implored as we pulled up to our London hotel room. Go back with a different air about you. A different aura. Hold yourself like a star. I think Miz did that when he came back after shooting his first movie. He repackaged himself and everyone looked at him differently, he said as he got out of the car. I can do that, I said unconfidently, already wondering if anyone would buy it. Episode 11. Let's get ready to rumble! While WWE may not have felt like I was the one yet, the lad I was seeing certainly did. When I got back to LA, he planned an evening out with me, taking me to the arcade on Santa Monica Pier. Let's go on the Ferris wheel, he suggested. I'm not really feeling it today, I responded, without admitting I'm a scared little baby when it comes to heights. Oh, come on, it'll be fun, he insisted, pulling me towards the rickety ride. I climbed in reluctantly, terrified, clutching the edges with a death grip. When we reached the top, the Ferris wheel stopped. Oh no, it's broken, I yelled, fearing this would be the end of Rebecca Quinn. Just then, he started to get up, shaking our capsule, petrifying me further, which only amplified as he got down on one knee and produced a small black box. Oh no, I thought. How could we have such wildly different views of this relationship? Will you marry me? He asked, opening the box and producing a pear-shaped diamond ring, or, as I saw it, a teardrop. Yes, I said like a fucking coward. What's one to do? Unless you're ready to break up there and then, you say yes like the good person you are and then break their heart at a much more suitable, convenient time for you. As we embraced, and I wondered how the hell I was going to get out of this one, the Ferris wheel started to move again. I was ambushed by a photographer and a man popping a bottle of champagne and a giant bouquet of flowers as we stepped off. At least I had said yes, otherwise this would have been pure mortification. I hid the ring from the public eye, embarrassed to wear it. I would ask my happily married friends ad nauseum. How did you know they were the one? I just knew they'd all inevitably respond like the cliches they were. Surely that's bullshit. Surely you go through the same painful doubt every single day of your life wondering how the hell you're going to get out of this. Surely. Surely it's perfectly normal not to want to tell anyone about your engagement, especially not your mother. It's not unusual to hide rings and photographs or not to think for a single second that you will ever actually go through with it. The few friends I admitted my condition to were all very nice about it. Realizing I would probably come to my own conclusions eventually, they gave me the standard, as long as you're happy, spiel. Colby was not one such friend, and when he found out, immediately texted me, what the fuck are you doing? You were just crying in my room about this motherfucker a few months ago. Jeez, man, don't yell at me, I thought. I know, I know. Look, I'll be honest, I don't think I'll go through with it. But if you're not ready to break up, how are you supposed to respond? Fair, fair. At least he understood, unlike my mother who wouldn't talk to me for three weeks after I finally told her. I'm not going to marry him, I insisted. You're ruining your life. You just told me at Christmas he's not right for you, she scolded. It was the worst when she was right. The weight of all the guilt was crippling, making it hard to keep that I'm a star or as Shawn Michaels talked about. 
but I would need to get my act together quickly. The dynamic of the women's division was about to change due to two things. Number one, for the first time in history, and from now on, there would also be a 30-woman Royal Rumble at the namesake pay-per-view. The winner would go on to get a championship match at WrestleMania. As a person whose favourite pay-per-view was the Royal Rumble, it was already monumental to compete at it, never mind competing in an actual Royal Rumble. Additionally, I was one of the first two people in the match, along with Sasha Banks. I knew there was no hope of me winning. That was reserved for Oscar this year. But what really got the world talking brings me to... Number two, the signing of MMA sensation and former UFC champion Ronda Rousey to WWE. Ronda, the catalyst for change in women's MMA and the reason women were allowed to compete in UFC, had transcended the sport to become one of the most widely recognized names in popular culture, being on the cover of magazines, on TV shows, in movies, and now she was one of us. The champions of each brand, now Charlotte for SmackDown and Alexa for Raw, entered the ring after Asuka won to give her a choice. Before anything else could happen, and while the remainder of the Fall and Royal Rumble participants were in Gorilla watching, Ronda Rousey was ushered through the group of sweaty wrestlers as her signature entrance music, Bad Reputation by Joan Jett, blasted in the arena to the sheer delight of everyone in attendance. She stormed down to the ring and pointed at the WrestleMania sign. But what did this mean? Was she going to get a title shot? Did she even know how to wrestle? The whole world was abuzz with the same questions. The monumental signing of one of the world's biggest sports stars to WWE eclipsed the Royal Rumble. But how did the women who had been grinding it out for years and years feel about this? Personally, it made me both excited and nervous. It was an incredible show of how far we had come, that someone of Ronda Rousey's caliber wanted to be involved in our division. Had we still been relegated to 30-second matches and bikini contests, I highly doubt it would have been an intriguing proposition for her. Rousey signing with WWE had the potential to shine a light on women's wrestling like never before, and I loved that for all of us who worked so hard to be seen as equal stars to the men. But I was nervous, because in the last year I hadn't been highlighted much. With the addition of this global star, I wasn't sure if I'd be highlighted ever again. We would be on different brands, but I was hopeful one day we might meet in the ring should she decide to stick with it. Despite the title of her entrance music and several rumors I had heard about her temperament, she was lovely. She was excited to be there, smiling and introducing all of us to the giant entourage that surrounded her. She also wasn't used to the competition being so friendly and supportive. But this ain't real, and it takes two to make money. And Ronda was money. She wouldn't be making her in-ring debut until WrestleMania, two months from now. Which was a wise decision. With so much content, it's hard to reserve matches and make people or stories feel important. But Ronda was an anomaly, and someone who needed to be handled carefully. Meanwhile, on SmackDown, I was doing nothing. Okay, so maybe this whole coming back as a star thing was overrated. Or maybe not even, but it might take a second. The build was on for WrestleMania, and I was in none of the conversations for big matches. Or any matches, really. While Asuka chose to challenge Charlotte for her title, I was relegated to the Battle Royal on the kickoff show. That's where all the wrestlers who don't get matches are sent. It serves mostly as a reward to the wrestlers who work their asses off every year and they'll still get a spot on the card and a decent payday, even if it's a token gesture and a match no one cares about. I confided my disappointment to Sammy. I feel like I work so hard, but I can't seem to break through. You know, man, enjoy it. WrestleMania feels like such pressure every year. But last year, I was in the Battle Royal and it gives you a chance to really soak it in and look around. Try and do that. That's a really good way to look at it, I admitted, and he was right. I took his advice to heart, but my God, all I wanted to do was main event that show. It's the ultimate goal of every wrestler, and it had never been done by a female. But hell, 
I could barely get on TV. How did I think I could main event? I was trying to take Sammy's advice, but hanging out with Charlotte and hearing her talk about her match and the ideas they had, I would be lying if I said I wasn't jealous, which I felt horrible about. I should have felt happy for her. I should have felt inspired. That if it could happen for her, maybe one day it could happen for me. But darn it, at this point, after years of being the bridesmaid, I wanted to be the bride, but not actually the bride, because that home life situation was the shit. When Mania came and I went out for the pre-show battle royal, Sammy was right. I could soak it in more. I got to look around at the stadium and watch everyone being so happy to be there and experience it. There really is nothing like being in front of a crowd like that. And when you allow yourself to soak it in, you never want it to end. Ultimately, however, I was thrown out so unceremoniously and with such little focus, most people had no idea I was no longer in the running. I got to the back and cleaned up to watch the rest of the show. Rhonda's match was excellent. She was in there with the greatest leaders she could have asked for in Triple H, Kurt Angle and Stephanie McMahon, and they'd gone over every part meticulously. Charlotte and Oscar also had a barn burner. My friend texted me, how great were Rhonda and Charlotte's performances this year? It has to be them in the main event next year. I will be that main event, my gut insisted. I was on the pre-show, eliminated with no one giving a shit whatsoever. I had absolutely zero reason to ever believe that I could be the main event. But there was a teeny tiny voice that said I could. And I was mildly annoyed that this friend hadn't recognized it. But in the meantime, I drowned my sorrows in copious amounts of free champagne at the after party, annoying Colby with my drunkenness and crying about my tear-shaped engagement ring that I now dubbed my ring of sadness. Episode 12. Money in the Bank. I woke suddenly one night. All right, we got a couple chapters in so far. Becky Lynch, it sound like thus far you were engaged, but you didn't um, really want to be engaged to this person. You didn't want to be with him anymore. Cry your heart out to Kobe, aka Seth Rollins. And then you worry about being your main event at WrestleMania. Uh, excuse me, it seemed like Becky, you are uh, one of those fake it till you make it kind of people. You're not really authentic. I'm getting thus far. I'm getting off this chapter, previous chapter. And it seemed like Becky, it seemed like, uh, it seemed like you were doing a little cheating there. You know, you know your relationship, but you're talking to another man, which is, uh, a mental cheating, not physical, but we don't get to chapter, I'm sorry, episode 12, but it's really getting interesting, and we're slowly starting to see the rise of Becky Lynch becoming the mod. You guys tune in, hit the like, subscribe. If you like this audio book, I have others in the live session of this channel, and I will uh, plan on doing more audio books, but let's keep it going. We are at the final, final round here. Not chapter, but the whole final section of the book. Let's continue on. We're going to get to episode 12. Night must have been 3 a.m. lying next to my fiance when a little voice in my head said, All your dreams are at the other side of this relationship. I wanted to excel in my career and main event WrestleMania, but in my personal life, I did want to get married and become a mother one day, just not with him by my side. After four months of being engaged, it had become inevitable this needed to end. For several weeks, I said to myself, next time we fight, it'll be over. So I'm not proud to say that when the fight did happen with me out of town and over a text message, I broke it off. He moved out while I was away in Europe for a two-week tour. I did feel bad. I liked him, but I knew it would never work. I knew it from the first day we met. I just wanted the company in this often isolating industry. And that was so very wrong and selfish of me. Once I had cleared up my personal life from the hole I had buried myself in, my professional life suddenly started to bloom. 
I felt like a magnet of good energy. I felt free, alive, and utterly invincible. Suddenly, I was more engaged in work, more invested in my friendships, and more creative. We were approaching the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, and I would be part of this year's ladder match. Maybe, just maybe, I thought, they might give me the briefcase. I'd been working so hard, and the people still liked me, mostly based on my underdog status and online presence. Whenever I wasn't featured on TV, I would always go to WWE's digital team and film something, anything, an interview, a silly pun video, or make my own, what I found, funny videos or stories for social media. But it would at least give the internet audience a chance to get to know me when I wasn't being showcased on TV. Charlotte was also going to be out of the picture after this match as she had to get surgery. So who better than me to win? Alexa Bliss, that too. Oh well, there's always next year, I comforted myself. Who should be the last person on the ladder before Alexa wins? Our producer TJ asked the group. I think Becky would get the most sympathy, Natty chimed in. We were the first match on the main card that night and Chicago was a rowdy bunch as always. I went through the curtain, not fully knowing what to expect. We thought it was a good match, but was it? We thought they would sympathize with me the most, but would they? I took the ring in the beginning while the rest of the girls scattered looking for ladders. The crowd immediately started chanting my name. Oh cool, they like me. Whether it was a semi-Irish connection between the natives and myself, or if it was that they genuinely hoped I'd finally pull one out, They rallied behind me like I was their hometown gal. As soon as I would put my foot on the bottom rung of the ladder, the applause and cheers got audibly louder. I finally made it to the top of the ladder. The briefcase was in my hands. But where was Alexa? Fuck, she was late. I was fumbling, trying to not take the briefcase off and accidentally win, but also trying not to look like a complete incompetent idiot. Finally, what felt like 10 minutes later, she showed up to tip me off to a chorus of boos. I crashed onto a ladder below before bouncing out of the ring. I watched as Alexa climbed to the top and unhooked the case. A mix of cheers and boos cascaded through the arena. Well, I thought as I rubbed the goose egg on my head, I think that went all right. We all dragged our broken bodies back to Gorilla where we were met with a standing ovation. It was the right call to have you up there last, TJ remarked. I think they liked you, he said as he smiled like a Cheshire cat. The next day, the crowd's favorable reaction to me became the talk of the town. It's not very often that someone catches fire with little momentum, so when it happened, podcasts and online outlets alike were urging the WWE decision makers to take notice. Which they did and pushed me to become the number one contender for the SmackDown Women's Championship against Carmella at SummerSlam that year. After two years of failing to capture any gold, and for the first time ever, I was getting a one-on-one title match at a major pay-per-view. It felt like me and the audience were all on a tandem surfboard riding this WWE wave together. Could I be the confident, unapologetic champion that I was not in 2016, but wished I was. Only time would tell. Or would it? Heavens no, this is wrestling. We need friction. We need controversy. We need betrayal, kind of. Charlotte, who had been out for surgery, rushed back from her time off. You could rip an arm off that woman and it would grow back a week later. Nothing kept her down and just about nothing kept her out. In an act of heroism, she ran out to save me from a merciless beating I was receiving at the hands of the dastardly champ. When Charlotte had done her duty and chased Carmella away, she offered me a hand up. I would have rather taken the beating with honor than be spared a whooping but show weakness. I wanted to stand on my own two feet, be it success or failure. Her interference won her a spot in our match. Now it would be a triple threat for the title, and the crowd was not happy about it. Charlotte had been so prominently featured since we were called up three years ago, and the crowd felt like this was my time to shine, and she had bogarted it. Ultimately, 
this was the plan of creative. Charlotte was going to win at SummerSlam and I was going to turn heel on her. And somehow, some way, the creative team could not see how I would be the babyface in this story. Not only would Charlotte win in the triple threat match on the night that, in the fans' eyes, was meant to be a monumental coming out party for me and my return to the top, but she would pin me to do it while I had Carmella on the verge of tapping. The turn needs to be justified, was a note that came from the production office. Justified? But I was the bad guy? They were about to turn me into a badass mega baby face. When the day came, SummerSlam 2018, I asked one of the writers, are we really doing this? Yes, the understanding is that you'll likely get a babyface reaction here in Brooklyn, but that's just because they're a heel crowd. There was a certain amount of tone deafness from the creative team, or maybe they genuinely thought that Charlotte was a strong enough babyface. As good as she is, she's a natural heel, but this was setting her up for failure. She knew this wasn't going to work and was visibly upset by it. They're going to turn you into Stone Cold. Meaning I would be a complete badass. She was right. I didn't have anything else to say about it except shrug. Being booked like WWE's biggest draw in history was nothing I was going to object to. If done right, this was going to catapult my career like never before. After years of taking a back seat, I wasn't going to let this opportunity slip through my fingers. That night, before going out, I was warned of several things. Because this is a heel crowd, they'll likely cheer you when you turn. I mean, it's not because they're a heel crowd, but cool. Don't look at them in recognition. No problemo. At the end, I had Carmella in my finisher, and as her hand raised up to tap the mat in submission, the crowd on their feet cheering, BAM! Charlotte hit me from behind with her finisher. Natural selection. One, two, three. And new SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair. A mixture of cheers and boos while I sat there looking heartbroken. Internally, I was happy as can be, knowing that this would be the biggest moment of my career. Charlotte stood over me, title in hand, face apologetic as the tension in the building rose. She prospered from my despair and everyone knew it. I got up and went to her, the audience unsure of what was about to happen. I hugged her and they erupted in a chorus of boos. They hated that I didn't stand up for myself, that I was just going to accept passing the baton yet again. As Charlotte hugged me, she whispered to me, This is your moment. Give it all you got. So I did. I slapped her so hard it was felt by the PE teacher who failed me all the way back in Ireland and back in time. The crowd let out their biggest pop of the night. As I steadied my focus on her, trying to summon venom and hatred in my eyes, I couldn't help but think, This is fucking cool. The audience was chanting, Becky, and you deserve it which could be interpreted in two ways. Either it was directed at her and she deserved a beating, or they knew this was the start of a new journey for me, a new push, and that I deserved it. I did what I was told and never looked up at the crowd, though I so badly wanted to take them in. We had been on such a journey together. I walked back towards Gorilla, only looking back at the damage one more time before getting through the curtain. Charlotte soon followed me through and we hugged and thanked each other. Are you okay? I asked. Oh yeah, woman, I'm good. She responded unconvincingly and a little standoffishly. I knew she was upset. I'm not sure if she was hurt physically or mentally. Are you sure? I've whacked you pretty good. I'm all good, seriously, she insisted, the tears building in her eyes. You would think she's untouchable by watching her on TV but she's an emotional and sensitive lady who wants to be liked. In the story, she was supposed to be the good guy, but everyone could identify with my story. The one who always tried their hardest, was never the best or the strongest or the most naturally gifted, but who had heart and fire and fight. They knew what it was like to be passed over for that promotion or not asked 
to that dance. Charlotte's story was much less common. Most people aren't born into fame or a multi-time champ or built like a goddess. The storytelling was all wrong. I knew it and she knew it, but it worked in my favor. Episode 13, The Promo. By the time SmackDown rolled around two days later, it was official. The turn was a success. But in reality, I hadn't turned into a heel. I had transformed into a bigger babyface. You're going to need to turn on the audience, I was told by writers. What would I say? It's obvious that they were the ones that supported me the whole way. To say they didn't is foolish. It's the only way they'll boo you. Look, if we do this, we have to play the long game. They're not going to boo me tonight, but I know I can get them there over time. I hear what you're saying while I'm thinking. You might hear me, but you're not listening to me. But we really need you to turn on them. But it's so obvious and desperate. They were clearly behind me the whole time. Can we compromise? They asked. I didn't want to, but I relented. Okay, I'll figure it out. I got with a writer and worked on something that reflected all I had gone through and the conclusions I had come to in the last few years. And of course, threw in how the audience hadn't always been there for me, which they had. It was imperative that this maiden voyage promo for this new character be a success and serve as my mission statement, which was that I was tired of playing nice and waiting my turn. I was not only going to be the face of the women's division, I was going to be the face of the whole company. It was about having the balls, for lack of a better term, to take what you want in life and no longer settling for second best. I went out there, marinated in all my pent-up resentment, anger, pouring out in every word, maybe too much at times, but I wanted it to feel real. The anger was more at me doubting myself than at anyone else. Then it was time to bash the audience, but the only thing I could say with a hint of realism to it was, you say that you support me, but when Charlotte won, you stood up and you cheered a new champion. So did you really care? But they didn't buy me turning on them. It felt like bullshit to all of us. There was an uproar online about the ridiculousness of me turning on the audience. WWE bowed to the public's pressure, immediately erasing that section of the promo from all platforms. Rolling over and squinting in my residence in hotel room, I woke up the next day to a text from a writer. Mr. McMahon doesn't want Becky to put the audience down. Her character is similar to Stone Cold Steve Austin. The look she gave proved she could draw money. I kicked my legs under the thin blanket like a five-year-old. Money? Vince thinks I'm money? Hell yeah, I'm money. After years of trying to prove myself, Vince believed in me. More importantly, I finally believed in myself. I was still being booked as a heel, but I was a big old renegade babyface. And it wasn't just in Brooklyn either. A few weeks later, we were in Mississippi and the Becky chants were as loud as they had been in Brooklyn. Charlotte was having a hard time with this angle and our relationship was becoming strained. We had already agreed to start driving separately to keep kayfabe, the act of preserving the storyline as authentic, alive. But when we did see each other, things were tense. Often leaving awkward silences in the locker room and having the other members of the roster be our mediators. Charlotte wasn't happy with things I had said in interviews. For example, calling out WWE's historical preferential treatment of books and blondes, thinking I was taking digs at her in real life, or social media posts I made. While I was trying to make the story as realistic as possible and go as far as I could with it, which admittedly was often too far. I never apologized for it or tried to squash the matter. I admittedly was rejoicing in my newfound success and thought she was being a baby. In hindsight, I could have been more sensitive or more forthcoming. In retaliation, however, I took her offense as a personal attack, thinking that she wasn't happy for my success and instead felt it was at the expense of her own. Business and friendship is a tough thing. All of this, I'm sure, could have been resolved with a conversation, 
but now we were in the midst of a power struggle. Neither of us was willing to yield control. We both wanted to be at the very top. So much for never let wrestling come between us. Even as our friendship sadly started to deteriorate with fake life causing real life animosity, for me, work had never been better. I was having a blast. Every arena was filled with We Want Becky chants. The creative team wrote me as though I was unstoppable. Having been on the opposite end of the spectrum, a baby face who was constantly getting her ass kicked and not following up on promises, I never wanted to go back. But also, I was being a badass at the expense of some poor good guy schlub. I would justify that, well, when I was in my shitty position, no one was trying to look out for me, and that was enough for me to sleep at night with a big happy head on me. It was all building to a title match at Hell in a Cell, where it became evident that I was ready to hold that championship. There was no more I just want everyone to succeed. I was the one now. Since losing my title after my very unfortunate run in 2016, I watched everyone who held it carry it with confidence, with self-assuredness. They didn't care about everyone else's turn or how it affected the whole locker room. Or if they did, they didn't show it as they went about making the most out of their run, which they absolutely should have. You worry about you and let everyone else figure their own stuff out. Episode 14, I am the man. I was going to be facing Charlotte for the SmackDown Women's Championship at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. The audience was already invested in this domestic spat between two former best friends, and I pushed it as far as I could to make sure it felt real, wanting every match to have that big fight feel about it. I was hitting all platforms with intent, and that intent was to get people to care. Promos, social media, interviews, everything matched. As I was living the gimmick, i.e. playing the character outside the confines of our TV shows. I often pushed the line, seeing how much I could get away with, and oftentimes taking terrible advice, especially as it pertained to social media and mean-spirited tweets. I do regret a lot of what I put out there during that time. I know controversy creates cash, but it also creates resentment and feelings of self-loathing. Proceed with your mean tweets with caution. Charlotte and I put our title match together rather sloppily, the underlying and somewhat untalked about tension between us like a pink elephant in the room. I knew I was going to win in the end, so how we got there didn't bother me. Even though this was a new character and I would have to adopt a new style to fit, I wasn't worried about how to make myself look strong or outdo her. In fact, I always think it's beneficial to try to make your opponent look as good and strong as possible. That way, if you win, you've overcome an obstacle. And if you lose, well, my God, did you have a hill to climb. Taking Colby's advice from a year earlier, I had found different ways to get my shit in. On this night, September 16th, 2018, Over two years since winning my first and only title in WWE, I would be winning my second. Only now, I was in a much better position than before. I won by catching Charlotte quickly by countering a spear and turning it into a pin. One, two, three. Creative suggested that she try to shake my hand afterward and I, cocky as ever, refuse and taunt her by rubbing the title in her face. That'll get the people booing, they thought. It did not. If anything, it made them cheer more. They liked that I didn't care about anyone's approval. In real life, I wish it could be like this. I imagine a lot of other people did too. That's why it worked. This story was outlined to go until the end of October, culminating in a last woman standing match at the first ever all-women's pay-per-view, Evolution, set to take place on Long Island giving Charlotte and me three pay-per-views to work together. Hell in a Cell, Super Showdown in Australia, and the blow-off match at Evolution. There was enough story to give the audience something they could sink their teeth into, and likely not too much that they would be sick of it. And maybe, just maybe, we could emerge from all of this and be friends again. We already had great chemistry, 
but it was getting better with every match we had. As friends, we hit each other hard, but as enemies, we beat the shit out of each other. And when I say Charlotte is strong, she is freakishly strong. With one strike in Melbourne, Australia, in front of 50,000 people, she hit me so hard that it severed a nerve on the left side of my mouth that took almost five years to recover. Actually, I just looked in the mirror. I'm not sure it fully recovered. I hoped that the giant swollen lump that was protruding by my lower lip was going unnoticed until Daniel Bryan, while mid-conversation after the show, blurted out, Was that always there? While crouching down and squinting to get a close look at my slightly deformed face. No, I was hoping no one would notice. I got hit in the mouth. Yeah, I can see that. And no, it's definitely noticeable. Thanks, Brian. Fuck. Good thing my character didn't care how she looked or what anyone else thought of her. Rebecca Quinn did, though, so it took me a long time before I could watch myself talk again. With all the steam I'd been gathering since SummerSlam, the company was doing everything they could to capitalize on the momentum. They were even bringing back wrestling legends for me to work with. They scheduled a promo for me to go up against Edge, someone who had been vocal about his support of me on my rise to this point. His career had ended abruptly some years earlier as the result of a neck injury, so seeing him back in a WWE ring was a coveted event. And for me, as a fan who admired him greatly since I was an angst-riddled teen, it reeked of awesomeness. Edge, beloved as he was, was tasked with getting the audience to boo me. Surely, with me opposite a legend like him, they would decide they hated me. What do you think about this? He began as he sat down beside me at a table in catering, offering suggestions on how the promo should go. I'd never worked side by side with someone of his stature and experience and was willing to do whatever he wanted. But him treating me like an equal and as if my opinions mattered made me feel as if I had arrived. What if I warn you about the path you're going down? Say that you're not going to like yourself at the end of it all. He continued enthusiastically. What would you say back to me? I was nervous to pipe up and respond. He was a Hall of Famer, a great of the industry. I didn't want to be out here chiming in shitty ideas to a legend. Maybe I lean into it? Like, I don't like myself, I love myself, I offered. Yeah, that's great, he responded, giving me confidence to continue. Then would it be too much if I said, get out of my ring, don't hurt your neck stepping through those ropes? I asked, not wanting to offend someone who would come back to work with me specifically, despite the fact that I had been offending my own former best friend for months in our storyline. Not at all, that's perfect, Edge retorted. When the words came out of my now deformed mouth live on TV, even with this blatant disrespect to someone the crowd loved so much, strangely, they cheered me. We had a special bond and it was lovely. For me, not Edge's neck. I tried, Edge yelled to everyone in Gorilla when he stepped back through the curtain. They're not going to boo her. He shrugged as he laughed it off. To add one legend's appearance to another, that weekend I was at a hockey game with Mick Foley. It wasn't lost to me that the same girl who had failed PE was now mixing it up with all the heroes she had looked up to on TV. What a freaking life. A text from a friend at the time landed in my iPhone at the game. You should call yourself the man. The idea was so simple and yet polarizing. In our industry and so many others, there was a long-standing history of brilliant people at the top of their game who have been referred to as the man. But they had all been men. Now that brilliant person was me. What would you think if I started calling myself the man? I asked Mick, looking for a second opinion. It's genius, he responded with a grin. I posted a picture of me holding up my championship in Edge's face with the caption, I am the man. We now had a slogan for the movement. It was powerful. Anyone could be the man. It didn't matter your background or your gender or what you do. You just need to claim your greatness and not let anyone tell you differently. Episode 15, Last Woman Standing. 
Charlotte and I were on our way to evolution, the final chapter in the book. Not actually the final chapter of this book, the metaphorical book, if you will. You know what I'm trying to say. Anyways, they wanted me to powder, leave the ring to get away from my opponent, and cheat and do all the classical heel things. Though they didn't want me to be a heel, or a face, or an in-betweener. They didn't know what they wanted, but I knew what I wanted. I wanted to be the best, and so I took their direction and did it to the best of my ability. Any holes in their logic I would try to clarify on social media or in interviews. Charlotte and I had, at the time, the longest women's match in SmackDown history, ending in me being speared through the LED board after I got purposefully counted out so I wouldn't lose my title, leading to us having a last woman standing match at Evolution. Neither of us had ever been in a last woman standing match, but the understanding was that these matches could be hard. You don't have standard false finishes such as pinfalls and kickouts or submissions, but I wanted this to be the best match of my career. Side note, I want every big match to be the best match of my career. We got to Long Island early. As the first all-women's pay-per-view, this was a big deal and they wanted to give us the best chance of success by practicing the matches a day in advance. Because of the lack of women on the roster, they had to rely on bringing back women from the past and calling up talent from NXT to fill out the card. So it was likely beneficial to all parties to have rehearsals. I, in a side note, didn't necessarily love that we were having an all-women's pay-per-view. It was viewed as a female empowerment thing, but I've always wanted equality. They wouldn't be able to get away with purposefully advertising an all-men's pay-per-view that would be seen as archaic or segregationist. Of course, at the time, they actually were forced to have all-men's pay-per-views as we had just started to run shows in Saudi Arabia and women were not yet allowed to wrestle over there. But in a way, to me, it felt counterproductive that we should grovel over being allowed to have our own pay-per-view. For me, it's much more impactful for us to outnumber men's matches on a standard pay-per-view because there are that many good female-driven storylines. Or to main event the pay-per-views, because we're that good and the audience cares so much that nothing can follow us. I didn't want special treatment, I wanted equal treatment, equal opportunity. Although when I did an interview with TMZ, they asked me, do you think people will tune in and watch because don't they usually like storylines? As if women were still relegated to having pillow fights in their underwear. I knew we had to make this pay-per-view extra special. Mine and Charlotte's story was easily the best one on TV and the mentality that was stuck back in the 50s of us merely being there as a special attraction really ground my years. To be fair, I say the 50s, but I was looking at a poster from 2014 the other day that said, Come see Seth Rollins, Big E, Jack Swagger, The Miz, The Big Show and the WWE Divas. And it sickened me. There was that special attraction shit, that lump us all into one category shit, that don't even call us by our names because you don't think we can draw shit, that tits and ass shit. And that was only a year before I got called up to the main roster. I want to be viewed for the work I do. I want gender out of the picture. And not because I don't like being a woman, but because it shouldn't matter if I am one. Where was I? Oh yes, this historic all-women's pay-per-view. We got to the building that day with a lot of ideas, but nervous about how to deliver to match people's expectations. We started talking about table spots and chair spots, guardrails and ladders and kendo sticks. The ring was still being put up, so we pulled the guy who handles all the props aside, giving him the laundry list of what we needed for the match and where we would like it to be placed. We don't have any of those things, the prop guy, Mark Shellstone, warned us. Uh, what? I responded in disbelief. No one told us we needed them, Shillstone confessed. It's a last woman standing match, Charlotte added. This is the biggest match on the card. How did no one know to get weapons for it? I chimed back in, a bit egotistical here, but hey, it was true. I have no idea, but what exactly do you need? He offered helpfully. Chairs, Charlotte started. We have... Five, I think, Shillstone volunteered. 
We need about 30, I insisted. Shit, said Chillstone. We need the wall set up so she can spear me through it, I went on. There's no walls, it's just guardrails. Fuck, Charlotte scowled. That spot was out. Ladders, I asked. We don't have any, Shillstone said, letting us down. Tables, Charlotte quipped. Nope. Kendo sticks, I joined in. We have some of them, Shillstone confirmed, relieved. So there was that. Luckily, we were only an hour away from WWE's warehouse, and because we had gotten to the building uncharacteristically early, it gave them ample time to get the hell out and get what we needed. I was insulted. Even with the hoopla of this historic event, the attention to detail on their biggest story flew under the radar. Charlotte and I, who were very civil throughout this whole process, got to work around the provisions we had now. There were several gaps we would be figuring out until almost bell time, but we were sure we had a banger on our hands. We were the second to last match of the card. The main event was going to Ronda Rousey and Nikki Bella. In my mind, that was both misguided and brilliant. Not that Nikki and Ronda wouldn't be able to put on a great match, but there was no way that they could compete with the level of match we would have. We had a story that was years and years in the making. Plus, we had weapons, which always makes it more exciting. But not getting the main event would seem like we were being screwed by the company again, and the fans wouldn't be too happy with that. Although it did put a lot of pressure on the other girls. It ended up being one of my favorite matches I've ever had. It was the first time, maybe since I got to WWE, that I felt completely present in the ring. I was receptive to the amazing Long Island crowd, not thinking ahead to the next spot or where my opponent should be. I often keep an eye on less experienced talent to make sure they're in the right position. Charlotte is so good that I didn't need to, as I trust her completely. We both talked to each other the whole way through the match to ensure everyone was on the same page. I was also only getting used to being in a position on the card where I was trusted to have big matches and big stories. But as Charlotte and I could always be trusted to do, we beat the hell out of each other. I jumped off the top of a ladder, leg dropping her through a table and landing with all my weight on her stomach. That she didn't actually shit herself there is a strong testament to her abdominal muscles. I piled every piece of apparatus I could find on her. Shards of broken tables, chairs, announcer table chairs, anything that wasn't glued down and sat back in delight as I waited for the ten count. Eight, nine, and like a zombie, she resurrected herself from the rubble. Only she just got to her knees and let out a T-Rex-esque roar. Fuck, I thought. Was the ref going to eliminate her? Technically, she was meant to get to her feet, but I don't think she was entirely clear on the exact rules of the stipulation. Charlotte is a very intuitive wrestler, and so this felt like the most natural thing for her, but technically she wasn't standing, so technically it should have been over. The ref let it slide. Phew, we had more stuff to do. She came at me with kendo sticks like swords in her hands and beat me mercilessly. As an aside, these kendo sticks don't look like much sometimes, but they hurt like hell. Unless you're me, who has my body mostly covered up, so I'll take a beating with them all day long. On bare skin, however, excruciating. We got to the crescendo. She had me left for dead on a table on the outside and went up to the top turnbuckle as if to moonsault onto me. Rookie mistake. With my last bit of energy, I climbed up and powerbombed her through the tables down below. Eight, nine, ten. I had retained my title and I had had a blast. We came back to standing ovations and hugged and thanked each other. The spark of a friendship that might be able to recover. Especially if this truly was to be the end of the storyline. I could go on to harass someone new. After the last match, there was a curtain call where all the wrestlers went out to the stage to celebrate the success of the night. I tried to avoid it. I thought it would compromise the integrity of the match Charlotte and I had to see us out there side by side, or even standing after the brutality we had put each other through. 
Alas, I was pushed through the curtain while battling in my head whether or not going out might be an insult to the girls who had worked so hard. I also believed that all of us going out was somewhat condescending to us. They wouldn't throw out the guys' storylines like this and pull back the curtain, so why do it to us? Regardless, there I stood, not smiling like the baby face of yesteryear, just trying my best to keep my character intact in the midst of my own personal turmoil about the matter. Episode 16 Bloodbath The Survivor Series pay-per-view was around the corner and it was champion versus champion. The SmackDown Women's Champion, the man Becky Lynch, versus the Raw Women's Champion, the baddest woman on the planet, Ronda Rousey. And it was the most anticipated match in the company at the time. Ronda and I agreed to go all out on our social media banter. She gave me some guidelines about what was off limits and would politely reel me back in if I pushed the boundaries. And though it appeared that we hated each other, she couldn't have been more game. She understood that this was business and anything said wasn't intended to be personal, even if it was based on sore spots. She seemed to truly be enjoying her time here, as she already had so much pressure on her from a young age between MMA and the Olympics and constantly being in competitive and hostile locker rooms, this was a welcome break. We tend to have a pretty great vibe in our locker room, especially when Charlotte and I aren't butting heads. All this to say, as much as I didn't want anyone to know, I loved Rhonda and I was excited that she was there and I couldn't wait to make magic with her. The juxtaposition of the two characters was perfect. She was from another sport, getting all of the attention and special treatment, and she seemed to be a natural in the ring. Versus me, the kid who failed P.E., the one who was chosen by the audience and had to scratch and claw for every morsel that she got. She was born tough. I was made tough. She was stronger and more skilled than I was, but I could take a beating and keep on moving forward. To quote Rocky Balboa, that's how winning is done. Rhonda knew I was a hot commodity in wrestling, and I knew her name would put us on a level that was never seen for women in the professional wrestling world. Week after week, we would cut scathing promos on each other. When she talked, the crowd would chant my name even though she was supposed to be the babyface. I was clearly still the underdog. And it was unlikely the office would have her lose. Before Survivor Series, we had our annual November European tour. Even though Charlotte and I were done wrestling on TV, we were not done wrestling in live events. And while we weren't close anymore, we could talk with no awkwardness. We classically beat the crap out of each other for almost 30 minutes every night for two weeks straight. By the end of the tour, my body was aching and my head was pounding. The newfound success I had acquired required me to do more media, which I loved, but it meant I had no rest time. Not that there was much on these tours anyway. The morning we were supposed to return to the States, as I was getting on my seven-hour flight from London to New York, I got a text saying that me and the rest of the women would be needed for Raw that night. Travel advised me that once I landed in New York, I would board a private plane to Missouri. It was past seven when we landed in the snow of Kansas City, and the show had already started by the time we made it to the arena. Mark Carano was there to greet us and usher us in. Everyone needs Smackdown shirts and jeans, he ordered as he led us to the locker room. We suited up while the producers gave us the layout of the show. We were the main event, and it would be pure chaos. As soon as I had my t-shirt and jeans on, I was rushed out to quickly film a segment with Rhonda, where I had her in an arm bar in the locker room while she flailed wildly. I was torn off by refs and producers alike, and that started the madness that would ensue. The Raw women's team, minus Ronda, was in the ring after Bailey and Sasha had had a tremendous match to determine the captain of the Survivor Series team. These invasion angles were always a ton of fun. It didn't matter if we were running on fumes. I swaggered out as a big old surprise, mouthing off all the way down to the ring. Once I got to the bottom of the ramp, the women from SmackDown jumped the ring from behind and beat up Team Raw. I slid in during the mayhem and, well... That's when it all became a blur. All I know was I went to turn Nia Jax around and she punched me square in the face. 
Naya was our largest lady. She's more than double my weight and is as strong as an ox. And while I'm sure this was an accident, it was the best accident that could have possibly happened to me. I remember thinking, oh, I'm concussed, as I slow motion crumbled by the ropes. After that, I have snippets of memories. I rolled out of the ring and went to grab a chair. Blurry doctor faces rushed me. Blood was pouring down my face. Already I couldn't even remember how it happened. Are you okay? They asked as they gave me a towel to mop up the stream of blood coming from my nose. Yeah, I'm fine, I quickly replied as I wiped my face before throwing the blood-soaked towel back at them. Gotta go. I ran in with a chair and proceeded to run my spot with Rhonda. She turns, I hit her in the stomach and then whack her in the back. The crowd chanting one more time. And well, when they're chanting one more time, you gotta hit her one more time. So I did, as cautiously as I could though. I was with it enough to know I wasn't with it at all and didn't want to get anyone else hurt in the process. After I did my damage, I left with the rest of the SmackDown crew through the crowd, up the stairs as the audience went wild. I stood there smiling and mouthing off, blood smeared all over my face, knowing that the camera was still on me and I couldn't leave until we had gone off the air. Once I was given the cue, I walked through the doors into the foyer where security was there to meet us. Where am I? I inquired to a fuzzy face escorting us. I had no idea what town I was in, what had just happened, or how the hell I had gotten there. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in the trainer's room with Stephanie McMahon looking after me like a proper mom. I'm scared, I said to her, turning into a six-year-old and feeling like my brain would never work again. I know, she responded kindly, her eyes never breaking contact like she does. But you'll be okay. Do you promise? I was the direct antithesis to the person I had been in the arena. I do, she said, nodding encouragingly. Having grown up around the business, she'd seen things like this regularly, and often with behemoths of men. I'm not sure any of them talked to her like scared little children, though. She guided me down the hall towards the ambulance that was waiting on site. Lori, one of our medical staff, came with me. I can't remember how I got here, I told her as Stephanie loaded me into the vehicle. That's okay. Do you know who I am? She asked kindly. No, I replied as I burst into tears. I knew I was supposed to know who she was, but I could barely remember my own name. The more I tried to remember, the more freaked out I got. I was shaking, possibly from fear, possibly from having a brain injury, probably from it being negative 20 outside. Stephanie took off her coat and gave it to me. Here, stay warm. She is a legitimate angel. The ambulance took off, sirens blaring, which seemed a little dramatic, but whatever. We eventually got to the hospital and Lori gave me my phone back. It's not the best to be looking at blue screens while you're out of it. I had so many, holy shit, that was awesome texts. I replied to a friend, did I get Rhonda? Get her, you became a star tonight. That's cool, I thought. How? What did I do? The hospital ran a series of tests, starting with a CAT scan. No damage to my skull, just a broken nose that I couldn't even feel. They snapped it back into place with minimum pain. Lori waited with me until one of our other doctors showed up. I knew it was pretty unlikely that Rhonda and I would have the belter of a match that I was hoping we would at the weekend, and I was already scheming of how I could work around my injuries. Sasha, Bailey, and Natty all unexpectedly showed up to check on me, which meant the world to me. Seeing them jogged my memory. Do you know how it happened? Bailey asked. No, but I do know you guys had an awesome match. <laughs> Thanks, Bex, she chuckled. I started recalling some of the innovative spots they had. Sasha and Bailey have incredible chemistry. Both are so good and creative that their matches together are nothing short of works of art. But recalling their match was bringing everything back into focus. And then I came down the ramp, but the other girls jumped the ring. Oh, and then I spun Naya around. Wait a second, it was Naya. Yep, Sasha confirmed. Oh man, did she come to the trainer's room? They shrugged. It was customary to check on whoever you may have injured though I'm sure she just didn't want to crowd me. Or maybe she didn't even know she had hurt me. I texted her. 
It was you. I am so sorry. Are you okay? Naya responded. Yeah, I'm just messing with you. I'm all good. It really does feel horrible when you injure someone. I would always rather be the injured than the injurer, and I think that's the same for any decent worker. There are few what you might call iconic photos in wrestling. Hulk Hogan slamming Andre the Giant and Stone Cold Steve Austin in a sharpshooter with his face covered in blood come to mind. It was none of my own doing, but thanks to this happy accident, some might say I joined that special iconic photos of wrestling club. In a way, paralleling my Rocky Balboa-esque journey on the top of the steps as my supporters cheered around me. One of our doctors arrived to drive me the four hours to the next city. I was fairly shattered after the day of travel, the time zone change, and, well, my face was literally shattered and my brain was mush. When we showed up at the building the next day, I was fully hoping to fake my way through the day. I can still go, I protested to the doctors, lying right to their faces, albeit poorly. They could sniff out my bullshit easily with a simple concussion protocol test. Remember these five words, apple, bubble, pencil, rabbit, banana. Banana, bubble, triangle, uh, no, uh, uh, I immediately started to cry. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm crying. Probably because you're concussed. I'm not, I'm okay. I might be tired, I pleaded. You're not, but that's okay, the doctor reasoned. Can I still wrestle? No. Not until you heal your head. How long will that take? A few weeks. Now I was crying harder. Can I not just work around it? No, it's too dangerous. Your brain isn't working properly. So this is how you could get another injury. Like you step wrong and then you've got a torn ACL and you're out for even longer. The most anticipated match on the Survivor Series card and one of the biggest matches of my career was now out the window and I was devastated. I was reassured from top to bottom that I would be okay and that this was better for me in the long run. As Mike Mansuri, an executive producer, put it, Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey at Survivor Series would have been cool, but Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania? That's a main event. If I weren't so messed up, I would have been excited. I was scheduled to do phone interviews that day for over an hour, Only, despite WWE's medical team following the procedure in textbook form, word hadn't reached the PR team to cancel them, and I sure as hell wasn't going to back out on my own. I sat in the bleachers, feeling like shit, trying to sort out my head while reporters asked me questions that I couldn't understand. After two interviews, I began to cry again. I don't know what I'm saying, I blubbered to my representative. It's okay, you're doing fine but I'm going to cancel the rest of the interviews. I was feeling more and more like a failure, let down by my own brain. Pushing to do a promo was probably not the best idea either. I needed to pick a replacement for me for Survivor Series. They wanted me to pick Charlotte and hug her, which to me felt like throwing everything we did down the drain. That suddenly we were okay with each other? I tried to fight it, but Road Dog assured me, she's in a pretty shitty position, You advocating for her would help a lot. Referring to Charlotte and Ronda happening on less than a week's build after having been pegged for a WrestleMania match. I couldn't argue when my mind wasn't in the right place. I had too many thoughts and too much confusion. It felt weird to go out there and hug Charlotte. Everyone had bought into our story. I didn't want to give them any indication it wasn't real. And the story was far from over. Episode 17, Heavyweight. I was going to be facing Ronda at WrestleMania. It would likely be a triple threat, including Charlotte, because Ronda would be leaving WWE after Mania, and they felt that it would be better to have two main eventers after she left instead of just one. That or they had already promised Charlotte that she'd main event and wanted to follow through with it. Likely the latter. The singles match would have been the better call from a storyline perspective and it was the match most fans wanted to see. But any way you slice it, it was going to be the first time women main evented Mania, and I was going to be in it. Better yet, I was most likely the person who was going to win it. A year ago, I was in the pre-show battle royal, 
thrown out unceremoniously by someone who wasn't even on the main roster. It was just a matter of how the hell do we get there? We were on two different shows and I still had the title. One idea was that I carry the title until Mania, but also win the Royal Rumble and choose her. You can't give a babyface too much these days. The fans see the machine getting behind you and they resent it. They tend to favor the underdog, the rebel with a cause, the one who rages against the machine. That's what I had to be. It took a few more weeks for me to be cleared to get back in the ring. My nose hadn't fully healed and I wasn't passing the standardized concussion test. We were a long way from WrestleMania, so we couldn't keep the rivalry between me and Ronda going until then, especially with us on different shows. So Creative pivoted to me losing the title to Asuka in a triple threat. Again, Charlotte was involved in the first women's tables, ladders and chairs match at its namesake's pay-per-view. While my brain was healing, so was my heart. My friendship with Colby had been growing since October. He was unhappy in his relationship and had been for quite some time and I had been unceremoniously ghosted by my latest fling. Colby and I had always had a connection, but now we were spending more time together due to booking circumstances and were bonding over our respective love life woes. His tended to be, maybe monogamy isn't for me. While I was, I love the idea of one person, but I don't seem to be matching with the right people. We talked openly and honestly about our thoughts and feelings with no judgment on either side. It was refreshing. He was flying into LA after a tour in South America and had the day off. Do you have a spare room? He asked. No, but I have a couch if you need somewhere to stay. I responded, being aware that as one of WWE's biggest stars, he could afford a hotel room. That sounds good. I was nervous about him staying. There was clearly something there, and if not handled with care, things could get messy. I picked him up from the airport, and as we rode over to the gym for a quick workout, somehow the movie Heavyweights came up in conversation. I've never seen it, I admitted. You've never seen it, he balked. We have to watch it. I don't have a TV, or rather, my TV doesn't work. You don't have a goddamn working TV, he scoffed. I never watch it. I live in LA, man. Too much to do. You can try and get it working if you like. Right, that's what we'll do tonight, he said, taking charge. As we got back to my one-bedroom Marina Del Rey apartment, and he went to work repairing my broken television to no avail, he confided that he and his girlfriend had taken a break. I tried to counsel him through it, even though after my shitty engagement and being recently ghosted, I was hardly feeling optimistic. After realizing TV repairman was likely not something Colby could add to his resume, he relented, I guess we'll watch it on my laptop, which would force us to sit closer to each other on my sectional couch as he held the laptop on outstretched legs. The movie had just started when he put his hand on my leg. Oh no, oh no, what do I do? I'm not ready for this. Ah! I thought on repeat for almost the duration of the one and a half hour movie. At one point, I attempted to match his body contact rather awkwardly, my hand finding its way to his arm rigidly while I hoped he didn't move any further. How was a newly single me expected to resist this giant brooding hunk of a man? But he was also my buddy, my pal, my colleague, and I did not want to complicate that. When the movie was over, we shifted our rigid hands and recited hilarious heavyweight scenes without ever commenting on the awkward body contact. As we both got tired and prepared to go to sleep on our respective furniture items, I gave him a hug that lingered a few seconds too long. If anything was going to happen, this would be the time for it to happen. But he would have to make the first move. I couldn't be charged with ruining our friendship. He did not. Probably for the best, I thought, as I made my way to my bedroom while he stayed on the couch. I woke up the next morning to him poking his beardy head through the door. You up? he asked. Yeah, I said. I am now, I thought, along with, get out of here. I look awful in the morning and I haven't brushed my teeth. He got into bed beside me. Did you sleep okay? Yeah, did you? I asked as I tried to keep my mouth shut in order to preserve him from my stank breath. Yeah, I sent you a text, but you were probably asleep already. Oh, I didn't see it. I picked up my phone to see a, you still awake text from my hot friend Colby. He admitted he had contemplated making a move. Luckily, I was already asleep. 
I wasn't ready for anything, and neither was he. He was just testing the waters, and they were choppy. We eventually got moving, already running late to meet our mutual friends for breakfast and workouts. We were back to normal, but maybe a little closer than before. And I was hopeful that if a guy is smart, cool and competent, not to mention handsome, as Colby was interested in me, maybe I'd find someone right for me outside of my work slash friend pool. Episode 18. Tables, Ladders and Cancer. I was going to have my first match back since my injury at the TLC pay-per-view in my first ever tables, ladders and chairs match and in my first ever main event on a pay-per-view. I didn't have the same level of swagger as before. I was back to officially being a babyface now. The broken nose sealed the deal, but immediately put pressure on me. Now I had to be likable. What if the people turned on me before mania? Then the old imposter syndrome started seeping in. You know the one? The one that tells you you're not good enough? That someone else is better? That you're a fraud and everyone is going to find out the next time you do anything? TLC took place in San Jose, where years earlier I had attended my first WrestleMania, hoping to one day be the main event. And while it wasn't WrestleMania, tonight we were the main event. I watched the match before a struggle amidst chance of we want Becky getting me excited. Or I would have been if that match didn't include my buddy Colby. So I looked on with conflicting emotions, hoping that this wouldn't make things awkward. The doubt that I had let set in was starting to dissipate. The crowd hadn't turned on me yet, but of course not. It was only my first match. Colby came back through the curtain looking dejected. He and his opponent, Dean Ambrose, had worked their asses off out there. But it didn't matter. The crowd had come to see the man. Colby passed me on his way to talk to Vince. They're ready for you, he said, discouraged. Charlotte and Oscar made their way to the ring. As soon as the music died down for a second, the chants of Becky ran through the arena before my music hit. Piss off, imposter syndrome, I pronounced valiantly to my own skull. We hadn't enough time to rehearse or locate where all the weapons and equipment we needed were beforehand, and so when we got out there, it was a bit clustered. The crowd didn't seem to care, though. They were invested in the story. And whenever one lands on ladders or goes through tables or gets beaten mercilessly with a chair, the audience tends to forgive any additional sloppiness. And despite our clunkiness in certain spots, there were still resounding chants of, this is awesome. It didn't feel awesome, though. It felt messy. At the end, Charlotte and I were on top of the ladder, inches away from victory, when Ronda Rousey came barreling down the ramp and tipped us off, allowing Oscar to climb up and become the new champion. A roar came from the crowd. Whether this was the excitement of having a new champion, Oscar, or the fact that it was now inevitable that they would finally get Ronda versus Becky at WrestleMania, I'm not sure, but they were happy about it. All three participants of the match came back not feeling great about ourselves. People backstage slapped us on the back and told us we were great, but we didn't feel it. Certainly I didn't. My first main event outing hadn't been the colossal success I wanted it to be. Not the most encouraging thing while trying to aim for the main event of WrestleMania in a matter of months. The day after TLC, as I was on my way to the next town, my brother asked me to call him. Christmas was coming up and I was going back to Ireland, WWE camera crew in tow. They were doing a special on me for the WWE network, making me feel like I was hitting the big time. Here, what would you think of going down and spending Christmas with dad this year? Richie asked. My dad lived in a county two hours outside of Dublin. I had always loved Christmas at my mom's, baking cookies, watching movies, staying in my pajamas for several days on end. I didn't want to give up that tradition. Can't he just come up on Christmas Eve? I replied. That was what we'd usually done, a tradition in itself, I justified. I just think it would be really nice and something different if we went down. He never gets to spend Christmas with us, Richie pleaded. But mom always does Christmas Day. And she made a great Christmas dinner. I could hear the frustration growing in his voice as I tried to argue with him while I wandered around the whole food salad bar trying to pick out my meals for the rest of the day. Becky, dad has lung cancer, he finally blurted out. 
The words walloped me like a chair to the back of the head. What? I asked out of disbelief more than a lack of understanding as the lettuce tongs fell out of my hand. Look, I'm sorry to tell you like this, but I just think it would be nice if we... Devastated by my own selfishness and inability to care about anyone else's convenience but my own, I interrupted him. Of course we can go down to him. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. How bad is it? We don't really know. He doesn't want to do chemo or anything. He didn't want me to worry you. When was he going to tell me? At Christmas? Yeah, I think so. Well, that would have been a shitty way to find out. As if there were a non-shitty way to find out your dad has lung cancer. I'm glad you told me now. Thank you. I was now bawling my eyes out as I walked through the drink section. Are you going to be okay? Yeah, I think so. I lied, not feeling okay at all. Thanks, Richie. I hung up and texted my mom. Dad has cancer? Oh, Becky, I'm so sorry. We didn't want to worry you. We knew you had so much going on. Are you going to be all right? How long has he known? We're not sure. You know how your dad is. He wouldn't tell anyone. How long have you known? Probably since October. October? What the actual hell? Richie had been holding this in for over two months. His older brother instincts of protection had him suffering in silence for months, unable to vent his worries. It sucked. It all fucking sucked. And I still had a town to make and smiles to fake. It would be a long few days until I could get back to Dublin. I called the people who were making the documentary and explained what was going on. We already had plans to film in Dublin, but now I wanted to spend time with my dad. Can we bring him up? Of course, Becky. We'll do whatever you need. Dan Pucciarelli, a real-life hero who's part of the backstage crew, assured me as he immediately went to work organizing hotels and car services for my dad so he might feel like a king. I met my dad in the hotel bar once he had arrived. He already had a signature pint of Guinness in hand. He looked healthy. If you didn't know any better, you wouldn't think anything was wrong. I got tequila. I needed it tonight. Sitting in leather chairs, he kept everything as breezy as he could, not going into specifics of anything. It was as if he had just been told that he'd have to get a mole removed as opposed to having stage 4 lung cancer, and bringing up his life insurance policy that he had somehow managed to maintain throughout his financial struggles, as if we were talking about the weather. His greatest hope was, despite none of his career ambitions ever panning out, that he would have some amount of money to leave us when he left. Dad, I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm fine. I don't need anything. I just want you to be okay. Through sips of stout and small handfuls of peanuts, he didn't sell a thing, as fathers tend to do, never allowing me to get the full scope of the situation. As a break from conversations of all things cancer, I brought up some happier news. It's looking like a main event WrestleMania. I'd love to bring you over. What's that now? He never really did keep up with the schedule or even understand the reach that WWE had across the globe. In fact, one time he mentioned to a nurse that his daughter was a professional wrestler and she produced a photo of me on her phone saying, is this her? His mind was blown. Bex, how did she get that picture? Google, Dad. Ah, yes, he responded, not actually having a clue what I was talking about. Such a sweet, uncomplicated man, my dad. I continued to explain the orbit of WrestleMania. It's our biggest event of the year, almost like the finals of the World Cup. The usual comparison to the Super Bowl would also be wasted on him. And there's never been a woman that's main evented it before, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be the first. All right, he answered, slightly unimpressed. When is it? April. Well, we'll see. We'll see. What do you mean? If I'm still here. On Christmas Day, we sat around my dad's tiny table in his modest government-appointed house, eating his deliciously cooked dinner. Over mashed potatoes and carrots, I had to stop myself from crying, trying not to let him see me upset. This could be the last Christmas I spend with my dad, I thought. Even worse... This could be the last time I see my dad. Episode 19. Point to the sign. 
Before we could make it to the main event of WrestleMania, there was the Rumble. I was set to get my first match with the now SmackDown Women's Champion and someone I regard as one of the greatest wrestlers out there, Asuka. She is a dream to work with. Between broken English and sweet giggles, she comes with a plethora of ideas and the most amazing footwork and finesse I've ever seen. When she goes through the curtain, she transforms from the sweetest human on earth into an absolute killer. And it was my honor to face her for the title. And more so, to put her over for the title. I was going to lose to her in the first match of the night and then enter the Rumble later that night. I needed this match with Oscar to go well. If it didn't, then people might not care to see me again that night. Or, as the annoying voice in my head said, they won't care to see me ever again. When I landed in Arizona, the home of the Royal Rumble that year, Colby kindly offered to pick me up from the airport. He had gotten in earlier that day and rented an Airbnb to stay at. You're welcome to join, he offered. I declined. I had to concentrate on my matches, damn it, and needed no man with a body built by the gods distracting me. Though I may have topped up my makeup upon arrival and given myself a little perfume spritz before getting in the car. The drive from the airport to the hotel took only 10 minutes, but we stayed talking in Colby's car for almost two hours. I hated how easy it was and would sporadically question what it would be like if we kissed, derailing my own thoughts by arguing that his beard would likely leave a rash on my face and that would be very uncomfortable indeed. Indeed. It was getting late and I had an early start time the next day. We hugged a hug that once again lasted a few moments longer than it should have before I retreated to my room, texting my friend Jay. I think I may be in love with Colby. To which he responded, I just turned on my phone and it appears to be broken. What? You literally just gave me a laundry list of all the reasons that would be a bad idea this morning. What can I say? Single Becky is unpredictable. It is a bad idea, I would remind myself. But you're single, Becky. You can explore whatever you want. No attachments. You get what you want out of it, you strong, independent woman, you. Hell yeah. I wasn't getting feelings. I was starting a goddamn movement. I was a regular Gloria Steinem, thank you very much. The following day, which was the night before Rumble, Colby invited me out to dinner. But I didn't finish my appearances until midnight so he tried to entice me to come to his Airbnb with a selfie. It's the selfie game we're playing, is it? Truth be told, I wasn't much into the selfie game. I often scoffed at the kids for their willy-nilliness to send selfies. Quite conceited, are we? Arrogance, is it? Look at me. I'm so beautiful that you will fall madly in love with me for my beautiful yet only slightly edited picture of me pouting like a duck, is how I imagine the inner monologue of the selfie sender goes. Whatever happened to wooing someone with wit and intelligent quips? A joke, perhaps? I'm not quite sure, but this was how the kids were doing it these days, so I decided to get hip with the kids. And by kids, I mean Colby, a full-grown adult male. I wasn't sending any selfies to kids. Anyway, my midsection had a hint of abs on this day, should I flex correctly under the right lighting, and I thought I should share them with someone, even if I was thinking, I really shouldn't but that's usually how the best stuff starts. To which he responded with heart emoji eyes and we continued texting like excited teenagers. I barely slept that night. Selfie adrenaline, nerves, and anticipation of what was to come combined were all taking chunks out of sleep time. The date was January 27th, 2019. The rumble where the man came around. It took place in Chase Field, a large baseball stadium that held upwards of 40,000 people. I walked out to a roar from the crowd. Fans holding the man signs illuminated the arena and I was overwhelmed with gratitude. My favorite pay-per-view of the year and this time I would be winning the Rumble at the end of the night. 13-year-old me wouldn't believe it. 31-year-old me barely could. Oscar and I took lumps out of each other for nearly 30 minutes straight. We knew we would go over our allotted time, but towards the end, we were getting yelled at by the ref, take it home, you gotta take it home, meaning we had to cut out a bunch of false finishes and go straight to the end. There were still a lot more matches to come, including two hour-long Royal Rumbles. 
She hooked me in her finisher and bridged over to a chorus of booze. The man couldn't do it. I tapped out. There's a weird thing about tapping out, that it can be argued for weakness, and especially with a strong character like the man. But I also didn't want to be that guy, the one who makes a fuss about tapping out or losing. At the end of the day, I was going to go on to win the night and potentially main event WrestleMania. The least I could do would be to make Oscar look strong on my way there. And I still had to go out again in a little over an hour. The adrenaline dump and exhaustion from not sleeping the night before were catching up to me. The plan was for Lana to be attacked by Nia on her way to the ring, thus rendering her unfit to compete and by proxy leaving a spot open in the rumble. I made my way out, summoning the energy of Zeus to a chorus of cheers, saw Lana crumpled up on the ground and wondered if anyone would mind if I joined her momentarily for a quick nap before getting on with business. No napping would be allowed as I argued with Fit Finley, who was attending our fallen comrade Lana and had suddenly become the authority on who was allowed in the rumble for some reason. Whatever it's wrestling, we make up the rules as we go. In the end, it came down to me and Charlotte. However, not before I got pushed off the stairs and my knee was injured by a salty Naya who had just been eliminated. I would have to overcome as many obstacles as possible on my way to the top. The referees were about to call the match, declaring Charlotte the winner, before I valiantly hobbled my way into the ring and after a series of blows, tossed her over the top and did the one thing that every wrestling fan turned wrestler dreams of doing, the classic point to the WrestleMania sign. Once you feel as though you've done it ad nauseum, the referee will yell at you, keep pointing. It's a hell of a shoulder pump, I'll tell you that. I came back through the curtain to an abundance of congratulatory hugs and backpats. As I made my rounds, I looked over to see that Charlotte was crying. I didn't ask why. We weren't close like that anymore. I assumed she thought her WrestleMania moment was dead and buried now. But I knew she would be included and knew she would always be okay. Not because she was Ric Flair's daughter, but because she was good. And she had a work ethic that would never let her down. The night was not over yet, though. I still had to watch Colby win his rumble. It felt so serendipitous that these two flirty friends were both having the biggest rumble nights of their lives. A true love story, even if one of the characters in this particular story didn't believe in monogamy anymore and the other was skeptical and guarded of the other's intentions. Anywho, Colby had been having problems with his back. He had fractured his spine in a match a little while ago, but hadn't told anyone about it because... He's a machine that can fight through just about anything and didn't want to miss out on this opportunity. He was also competing for that WrestleMania main event spot. I watched nervously, knowing he was going through a table mid-match, and I prayed to the heavens that he didn't mess himself up too bad. That would have really put a dampener on this flirting. When he came through Gorilla, there were camera crews there to capture him. I hugged him as I awkwardly tried to get out of frame. This flirtiness had become pretty obvious and I didn't want to give the game away on camera. You coming to get food? He asked. I've got friends in town, so I'll probably go see them. But let me know where you end up. I was going to have to go to Raw the next day to choose my opponent for WrestleMania. And again, I didn't want any distractions. So I knew this was a false promise of meat uppery. But one must keep one's options open. While out for dinner, he was sending me pictures of his food, which looked far more appealing than ours. We're still eating, so I might have to pass on tonight. I finally bailed. I was supposed to get a red eye tomorrow after all, but should I stay and hang out? Yeah, do that. That would be cool. Except I have to be out of my Airbnb by tomorrow morning. You can just stay with me. I responded while I'm thinking, what are you doing, Rebecca? This is a terrible idea. And then the devil on my shoulder would chime in. Relax, you don't have to do anything. It's just your friend Colby. You love hanging out with your friend Colby. It's true, Mr. Devil, sir. I do. Cool, I'll bring my bags over when I check out if that's okay. Sure is. See you tomorrow. Sleep tight. I was working out in the hotel gym when Colby said he was on his way. Flustered, I finished my set and ran upstairs to shower before meeting him at the elevator. My body language was signaling my nervousness as I desperately tried to fight it. You're the man, remember? You're the freaking man. God damn it, why can't you just be the man in real life? I argued with myself. What the hell are you so nervous about? It's your friend. You know it's not going to go anywhere. 
Just have some fun and stop being so uptight. Mind if I get changed? He asked as we got into my room. Why do you need to get changed? I thought, but I responded. Make yourself at home. My voice cracking like that of a prepubescent boy. He didn't go into the bathroom or attempt any other form of modesty, just stripped down to his underwear right there in front of me, quads glistening as the sunlight cascaded into the room. Fuck. Well, it's gonna happen, Rebecca. No use in fighting it now. Assert dominance, I thought. Would you like a kombucha? I asked, the most millennial pickup line ever. The mini fridge in my room was just beside the bed, which was exactly where he was sitting. Sure. What you got? Mint mojito, strawberry serenade, raspberry hibiscus. I'll try the raspberry hibiscus. I bent down to get the bottle, then stood up and gave it to him. The kombucha, that is. Now is the time. You got this, Quinn. You are the man. I stood directly over him, straddling his legs while he was seated on the bed. He had talked a good game. Let's see if he can back it up. He looked nervous. I could tell I was right by the way he said, I'm nervous. Our lips met and soon we were in full makeout mode. So this was what it was like to kiss him. Beard tickling, tongues rolling, my heart pounding. Years of sexual tension and energy went into this one moment. I wasn't expecting that, he said after. Bitch, of course you were. You were laying the groundwork for months, possibly even years, I thought. But I responded, me neither. We were both liars. We should go, I said, finally putting an end to its progression. We had a whole night ahead of us. Raw had an early call time and I was feeling like the new kid at school. I was a Smackdown resident and being in this new environment had me a bit on edge. Colby and I didn't see each other throughout the day, but stayed texting and flirting, recalling those tender hotel moments earlier that day. But back to the task at hand. This was the moment everyone was waiting for. I was choosing Ronda Rousey as my WrestleMania opponent. Coming off the highs of the night before and the events earlier in the day, I was feeling pretty darn good about myself. Unfortunately for Ronda, she had just had a promo where the crowd had chanted for me and derailed her train of thought, followed by not her best match. However, it did make my entrance that bit more exciting and we needed all the excitement we could get to earn that main event spot on Mania. But considering my emotional butterflies, what was at stake here, and days running on no sleep, I was jittery to say the least. Somehow I managed to deliver a promo that at least seemed like I was calm, cool, and collected, which was followed by a riled up promo from Rhonda in retaliation. This time, the anger she felt for the crowd and their unapologetic favoritism and probably a bit for me, lit a fire under her. And thus, my double duty on both Raw and SmackDown began and would remain in place until WrestleMania. TV time is prime real estate to a performer, but as a babyface, if you get too much exposure, you run the risk of the audience getting sick of you, which is also the risk I was running with escalating things with Colby. We work together. What if we get sick of each other? Nonetheless, I waited for Colby to be done in the hallway of the Phoenix Arena, trying to make it not so obvious we were leaving together. We made it back to my room, shut the door, and immediately began pawing at each other. Clothes were thrown across the room, and I kept thinking, Ah! My friend Colby's gonna see me naked! What if he's not into it, and then it's all just awkward from here on out? Abort mission! Abort mission, Rebecca! Oh, but it feels so nice, and he looks too good! You're in too deep now, Beck. Well done, you failure. But on the outside, I tried to feign confidence and fumble my way through. This new level of intimacy could change everything between us. Lying beside him felt so comfortable, but I still couldn't wrap my head around the fact that I was in bed with such a longtime friend and had just experienced him in a whole new way. I was less thinking, he's the one, and was more thinking, I wonder how we'll get out of this and not feel weird around each other. Episode 20. The Slap. Do you want to hang out again? Kobe texts me about the upcoming loop we were both on. This is already too much, I thought, but of course responded. 
Sure, let's do it. I arrived in Portland where he was watching the Super Bowl with Bailey and a tag team called The Revival. Everyone polite enough not to say anything, even though we were obviously getting cozy. Later, I tried to fight my instinct to get close to him. I knew I needed to keep my distance. But being with him was so effortless. Everything clicked. Conversation, interests, outlook. We had every type of chemistry firing on all cylinders. And while we lay there talking, he interrupted me to tell me I looked gorgeous. Aww, I cooed as my heart melted, feeling like a princess. Maybe there was potential there. But I was worried about getting distracted. I needed to be well-rested, head fully in the game. And though it was also easy to have someone who understood my concerns, in many regards, he was my competition. We were both aiming for that top spot in the main event of WrestleMania. The next day at Raw, I was set to do a promo with Stephanie McMahon. Usually you're onto something big when the McMahons are in the storyline. It is the ultimate rub from the company. The story was that my leg was clearly hurt from the rumble and she needed me to sign a hold harmless agreement, which my character's paranoid mind took as them trying to screw me over. It was so awfully orchestrated that I'm not actually sure what it was intended to do. Stephanie couldn't look too much like the bad guy, but in turn, I looked like the asshole. She came across as compassionate and concerned about my well-being, whereas I was fired up about her being a rich daddy's girl and refused to sign the hold harmless agreement. In turn, she took me out of the match and I attacked her mercilessly. I will say, even though the story and the execution made me look like a petulant child, I was pumped to be in a storyline where I got to beat up Steph. She nails every role she plays and is a dream to work with. All this to say, my immense violence against Vince's daughter and the chief brand officer of WWE forced Vince to suspend me in Storyland, giving me yet another obstacle I would have to overcome. That night, Colby found a hip vegan Portlandy spot for us to go where we could go incognito. As we chatted and played footsie over hummus and cucumbers, he asked what my expectations were in all of this. There were none, really, other than I expected not to get hurt at the end of it. I was concentrating on wrestling and that had to be my number one priority. When I said you were gorgeous yesterday and I saw the look on your face, I thought, oh no, he said, implying that he was worried about me catching feelings. It felt like a revelation. Well, that's it then. We really shouldn't go any further. He asked if I wanted to stay the night and drive in the morning, but I declined. Despite the fact that I was about to drive in a wild snowstorm that just hit the area, I thought it better to begin my distancing now. Especially because this episode of SmackDown was going to be a big one for me. Because I had been suspended the night before, I was going to make my entrance through the crowd tonight and interrupt a promo by the one and only Triple H. Was I dreaming? A promo with Stephanie McMahon and Triple H in the same week? The most powerful couple in all of wrestling? Triple H had gone from the person I had watched at home as a kid and despised because of his great heel work to the person I loved because of his booking of women in NXT. And I was about to go face to face with him and slap the crap out of him. I was led up to the stands and hid out in a janitor's closet with all of its glamour and jumped up and down like a giddy three-year-old about to get ice cream. I got my cue and started to make my way down through the stands, feeling like the most badass person on the planet. And the crowd kindly treated me like I was too. Thankfully, the awful segment the night before hadn't done too much damage. I got in the ring, running my mouth, Triple H and me trading shots back and forth until it was time for my big moment, the slap that was going to set the world on fire. I cocked my arm back, ready to deliver the slap of a lifetime. I lined up my target, taking bearded surface area into the equation. As my hand got closer, I realized I completely underestimated my own wingspan missing the mark with only the tips of my fingers gracefully fluttering against his cheek. Ah, fuck. God bless him, he's a pro. He sold it like I clattered him, the crowd graciously cheering as if I had drawn blood and taken out an eye. I swaggered back through the crowd, back through the swanky janitor's closet and made my way to Gorilla. That was great, Vince remarked, giving me a hug before adding, but we're going to need Steph to teach you how to slap. I left 
discontent regardless. My shameful night on Raw had been turned around by a big victory on SmackDown. The next day at home in LA, I took a hot yoga class to sweat the remaining stench of Raw out of me. When I had complete clarity, I needed to tell Kobe immediately that we couldn't continue any more of this malarkey. It would be the biggest mistake ever. I can't do casual, and he isn't looking for anything serious. But I could be the best friend he ever had. We just had to end this right this second and be BFFs forever. Mid-downward dog, I became so consumed that I grabbed my mat and water bottle, dabbed the sweat off my body, and rushed out of the studio to text Colby. What are you up to? Just teaching class, he replied. He owned a wrestling school and taught there regularly. How are you, sweetheart? Ugh, swoon. I love that he called me sweetheart. But still, clarity. I now had clarity. I'm great. So great. I won't bother you. I'll talk to you after. You're never bothering me. What's up? Well, I just had an epiphany. We can't do this anymore. We just have to be friends. Wait, what? No, why? He responded. You don't want to get into anything, and this has the potential to get messy, so we're better off ending it now. I was so excited to tell him how terrible this all was. That's not what I want. Is it something I did? If you don't like me, you can just tell me. No, I think you're the best. But it's like this. If I go in with no armor, I'm begging to be pummeled. But if I go in all suited up, I don't feel anything. So what's the point? This is a great thing. You're not looking for anything right now. And this way, we can be the best of friends and you can sow all your wild oats. I guess you're being smart. I hate that you're being smart. He might have hated that I was being smart. But I loved it for me. I went to bed happy as a clam. When I went to go train with our mutual friend Joshy G the next day, he had already heard about our conversation. What are you doing? Josh asked me, judgingly. He's not interested in me, Josh. He wants to be single for a while. This is the smartest thing. You guys just make sense, though. No, honestly, this is the best for everyone, I argued. Colby texted me later that day, still downtrodden by this decision. Can we still hang out this weekend? Of course. Do you want to stay in my room? I can do that. I love a slumber party. Who doesn't love a slumber party? That's totally something BFFs do. And so, after a loop where, because I was suspended, I would just show up and beat some people up and then leave, which really is a great gig if you can get it, I rocked up to the Hilton in Grand Rapids. He had left me a key at the front desk and had pre-warned me. This room is huge. Great, I thought. All the better for the separation. I put my key in the door. True to his word, the room was huge. I walked down the hallway and rounded the corner to find him in bed already. In the bed already, I should say. No twin beds, as would be customary for this grown-up slumber party. And he had his shirt off, his pecs sitting above the sheets, an acceptable amount of chest hair highlighting his definition. My God, he looked good. Maybe this wasn't going to be as easy as I thought. I'm going to shower real quick, I said while thinking. Fuck, fuck, stand your ground. It's better to just be friends. You're smart, Rebecca. Be smart. I came back and hopped in dangerously close beside him. I'd already gone too far. Pheromones acting like unstoppable magnets. My body had a mind of its own. A horny mind of its own. We talked for over an hour, our faces being drawn together until we were mere centimeters apart. And that was it. We were passionately making out. Clothes were off. We were in too deep. The connection was too strong. And it felt so right. The next day, as we walked through the icy Grand Rapids street en route to coffee, we actually held hands. It didn't strike me as the hand-holding type. What happens from here? He asked. Ah, I don't know. Fuck it. We'll figure it out. Episode 21. Suck it. Raw was all about the man. The McMahons had invited me to come back and I could get my WrestleMania match back if all I would do was apologize. I had multiple segments with different characters, old friends including Fergal, 
and foes, including Rhonda, advising me to apologize. It was a bit of a catch-22, whatever way you looked at it. I had made a point of ensuring the character came across as smart and aware, but considering the previous week's emotional outburst, smarts wasn't exactly what I was selling. Seeing as I did, in fact, beat up Stephanie, I should apologize, but also the McMahons were notorious for screwing people over. What's a gal to do? Life was imitating art. I fought to try not to apologize, considering the likelihood it would be futile. The least my character could do was stick to her convictions, however skewed they may be. I lost that battle. They thought it would be more impactful to see how reluctant I was and then have it taken away. And so, in the main event segment, I did it. But if all it's going to take is two words, then... I would have loved to say, suck it, Triple H's famous catchphrase. But no dice. I'm sorry. With that, Vince came bounding through the curtain in classic Mr. McMahon swagger. Even though I had no love for this creative, that was pretty freaking cool to be the focal point of a promo with Vince, Hunter, and Stephanie. It was like I had transported myself back to the Attitude Era, the peak of my fandom. Of course, Vince didn't come as a messenger of joy and reprimanded me for being the asshole that I was and said that I could never lay hands on his daughter. Which, hey, man, you're right. I do the same thing. But now I was suspended for 60 days, which naturally would take me up to the day after WrestleMania. What? Rhonda and I were, storyline, pissed. We were gearing up to destroy each other once and for all in a sanctioned match at WrestleMania. However, Vince came up with a suitable replacement, what he called the epitome of the embodiment of a WWE superstar, my arch nemesis, Charlotte Flair. The crowd booed their faces off. There was no way Charlotte was being left out of the WrestleMania main event. I didn't mind her being in there. Triple threats are some of my favorite types of matches. It's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. But also, I knew that it would be an extra layer of heat which always helps the baby face. It would also leave something on the table for me to have at a later date, seeing as we hadn't given away Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey. The other part of me, the part that, despite the ups and downs of our friendship, has nothing but love for Charlotte, was happy that we would get to do this historic match together. And should we rekindle that bond, it would be a special memory to share. But as the obstacles in the story kept mounting, the next night I showed up again, regardless of my suspension, on SmackDown and was attacked, leading to me being on crutches for the next few months. I suppose I had that one coming. The man had become a bit of a dumbass. To turn things around, at least in my personal life, when I got back to LA, Colby surprised me at my apartment with a beautiful bouquet of flowers and some fancy dark chocolate. I may have a slight obsession with the dark chocolate. It was the week of Valentine's Day, and he had all sorts of outings planned, including going to see Bring Me the Horizon in the Forum in LA and a dinner together for Valentine's night, where the exclusive conversation came up. What do you want to do here? Do you want to date? He asked. No, I don't think so. You're not ready for it. I put the heat on him when, in reality, I wasn't sure I wanted to. I'd never been in a relationship that hadn't broken up. If we were an item, it would eventually become public. And if we broke up, it would be awkward. Everyone would have their input on it. What would work look like? From what I had seen, when people at work broke up, one always came out looking worse than the other. And eventually someone would have a meltdown and either leave or get fired. I didn't want to go through all that. But maybe I am. Maybe I wasn't with the right people before, he conceded. You'll regret it if you don't go and sow your wild oats, I said, still putting the heat on him, though I wasn't ready to commit. I wasn't even ready to commit to not committing. It was all too scary. I left the next day for an autograph signing in Houston, Texas, ahead of the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. I didn't have a match at the pay-per-view, but I was going to appear and beat the soul out of Rhonda and Charlotte, doing terrible at this being suspended thing. But I was a rebel with a cause. I'm pretty dumb, apparently, but so were the security guards, who couldn't stop my crippled, crutch-wielding self from entering the ring. 
But before all of that went down, I had babies to kiss and hands to shake. While doing so, I began to notice that whenever someone came up and either brought Colby's name up or perhaps was wearing his shirt, I got overwhelmingly excited to talk about how great and talented, kind, smart, funny he was, how gosh darn handsome he was. I swooned as little cartoon love hearts popped out of my head as the fan smiled and nodded awkwardly. Shit! What are you doing, Rebecca? I'd stop myself as I tried to shoo away the butterflies that seemed to be populating my organs. The conversation in my own mind was going something like this. You're really into him, aren't you? No. Why not? Because he's so, so perfect and gets me and is the most incredible human I've ever met. Damn it. I was into him. Fuck. I got to the arena for Elimination Chamber. Kobe hadn't even landed in Houston and I was texting him that I missed him and couldn't wait to see him. What happened? Are you okay? He asked, confused by my sudden affection, a departure from the somewhat aloof game I had been playing. Why are you all about it all of a sudden? Kobe asked as we drove after the pay-per-view. I was already showing more affection than I had before, stroking his arm as he drove, smiling at him non-stop. Earlier at the signing, whenever someone or something reminded me of you, I got this weird subconscious excitement. I just wanted to talk about how great you are. It made me realize I might be kind of into you. So do you want to do this? Like, do you want to be a thing? Yeah, I think I do. So we're doing this then? We are. Oh, that's wild, man, he said, stamping our officialness into the cosmos. It was wild, and it felt so right. We now just had to figure out if we cared about this becoming public. I wondered if the man should have a man, and if that would do anything to my mystique, if I even had mystique. Best to just keep it on the down low for the time being. We were having coffee that morning in a cafe near the arena and Fergal walked in while we were all cozied up. Fergal and I were so far past any sort of romantic relationship that there was zero weirdness, but it did make it obvious that Colby and I wouldn't be keeping this a secret for very long. And that was okay too. Episode 22. K Fabe. The next few months were a battle to stay hot while on the road to Mania. I ran the risk of being overexposed by being on both shows, coupled with the non-stop appearances I had once sought after so badly. The thing that had gotten me over in the first place was that people sympathized with me being overlooked. How long would they stay with me now that I was clearly being backed by the company? And would they care to see us in the main event of WrestleMania? As enticing as our match had the potential to be, and as popular as the story had been, there were several other viable options that made sense. For example, Kofi Kingston, who had been with the company for 10 years, was gaining even more popularity with the crowd. It was Kofi Mania. The man is one of the kindest and most genuine people you could ever meet. It was impossible not to root for him. And with him being about to get a well-earned title shot at Mania against Daniel Bryan, that could very easily make sense as a main event. There was also Colby versus Brock Lesnar. Lesnar was a well-tested main eventer and a proven draw. Colby was the best wrestler in the world, who has arguably had the biggest mania moment in recent history when he cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase in the main event of WrestleMania 31. He was beloved and respected by the crowd. Nothing is guaranteed. To bolster my anxiety, my dad started to take a turn for the worse. They had put him on an experimental medication and every side effect they could possibly warn him about was affecting him. His liver function was rapidly decreasing and the doctors let him know that unless that improved, there was no way he could travel. My mom also made a point about insurance. In America, he would not be insured, while in Ireland, he was completely covered by governmental health care. I didn't want him to miss this. Maybe that was self-serving. Maybe he wouldn't care. I just wanted my dad to get to the other side. 
guilt of not being able to be there for him if anything went wrong was consuming me. I would be given the opportunity to win my way back into the WrestleMania match at the next Fastlane pay-per-view. It would be me versus Charlotte once again, and if I won, the match at Mania would turn into a triple threat. Only this time, I had the added obstacle of being on one leg, though I had already beaten her on one leg before at the Royal Rumble. I could do it again. Only in the story, I couldn't. She picked me apart by going after my bad leg relentlessly. The odds were insurmountable and it would take a miracle for me to pull out a victory. Well, either a miracle or a little pouty angel in the form of Ronda Rousey to come down and interfere. If Charlotte were to lose via disqualification by way of Ronda interfering on her behalf, then I would be back in the match. Ronda came down, bullying as ever like the human weapon she is. However, she hit me with a laughably weak punch to make her point that she was doing this as a way to get me in the match, where she was really hoping to destroy me. I rolled to the corner as they made the announcement. Winner by disqualification, the man Becky Lynch. I laughed as the audience cheered. We were getting closer to the main event of WrestleMania, where it would officially be a triple threat match between Becky Lynch the Raw Women's Champion Ronda Rousey and the SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair and the winner would take all. I just needed to stay healthy and relevant until Mania, the latter being the harder of the two. Episode 23, The Build. WrestleMania 35. It was a nice number. It seemed like a good year for women to be the main event. We were still running hot. People still cared. But one can never bank on anything until the actual day. Cards subject to change is a very real thing. However, on Sunday, the 24th of March, 2019, I got my answer. I had just finished the show in Buffalo, New York, and had a nearly seven-hour drive to Boston for Raw. It was on that drive that I got a text from Vince to myself, Charlotte, and Rhonda. I pulled over to the side of the road and read the most glorious text I had ever received. You will be the main event of WrestleMania 35. We are going to announce it tomorrow. Congratulations. Holy shit. What am I reading? Is this real? Did I hit a deer on the drive and I'm in a deep coma dreaming all of this? I shook my head. I wasn't misreading it or misinterpreting it, was I? I don't think so. There was only one way you could interpret that. We were the main event of WrestleMania. Historical. First time ever. I needed to tell someone. As great as this little dance party I was throwing myself alone in the car on the side of the 495 was, there was too much excitement to keep to myself. I texted Colby. Vince just texted. We're the main event of WrestleMania. They're going to announce it tomorrow. That's interesting. I wonder why they would announce it. Because it's never been done before and it's a big deal. I wanted someone to share my excitement. But I wasn't getting the reaction I wanted from him. Of course, I was being selfish. I didn't consider how upsetting that news would be for him. He had always wanted to main event WrestleMania. And he had a chance to do it this year until his girlfriend took it away from him. I became cold and distant, hurt that he didn't congratulate me right away. There were still at least three more hours on my drive. He was already in the hotel in Boston waiting for me, but I had plenty of time to find a new one for myself. Yeah, I suppose this year is different. I think I'll stay somewhere else tonight. It'll be late when I get in. What? No, what's wrong? He asked. I just gave you the biggest news of my life and you didn't even say congratulations. Sorry, you know how I like to analyze things, especially when it comes to wrestling. This isn't one of those things. This is the biggest deal of my life, I responded, upset. You're not staying somewhere else. Just come here. I arrived three hours later, still cold and distant. Why are you getting so upset about this? I'm sorry, I should have said congratulations. It was my own jealousy. Because I feel like you don't think I deserve it, I said through tears. He hugged me tight. Though the fact was, 
It wasn't him not believing I deserved it. I wasn't sure I did. There was my imposter syndrome again. A syndrome that is maybe never more rampant than in the sport of professional wrestling. A profession where you literally have to fake it to make it. In an industry filled with larger-than-life characters, muscle-bound athletes, and charismatic enigmas, how was this once pudgy, awkward girl from Dublin going to be on the same marquee that once boasted Stone Cold Steve Austin versus The Rock? However, in good news, the doctors had switched my dad's medication and his liver was rejuvenating rapidly. He was going to be allowed to travel after all. My whole family was going to be able to make it out. The only problem was that I had so many appearances that week, I would barely be able to see anyone. When I got to the hotel for WrestleMania week, it was jam-packed, filled with wrestlers and fans alike. I barely had time to put my bags in my room before I was shuttled off to the warehouse in Connecticut for a match rehearsal. Charlotte, TJ, our ref, Spider, and I sat in the warehouse waiting for Rhonda, whose driver had taken her to the wrong spot. While we waited, all running on fumes after months of going non-stop in the lead-up to this historic match, TJ read out the creative direction for the match. I was to win via armbar on Rhonda, and me and her should barely touch. This would leave Charlotte to be relied upon heavily. Hearing the direction, Charlotte was on the verge of tears as TJ went on. It just feels like I'm the third wheel, she cried. While TJ and I looked at each other, both considering how to carefully and compassionately broach the situation, Spider, flamboyant and brash, blurted out, Bitch, you are the third wheel. That's the heat. He was right. Triple H had made a career out of being the one in the middle, whether it be between Rock and Austin or anyone else who was over. But that made his job no less important. If anything, it made him even more valuable, as he could be inserted anywhere and added value. Eventually, we came up with a few ideas of false finishes. One idea was that I have Rhonda in an armbar and she is almost about to tap when Charlotte comes in and stops it. When Rhonda finally arrived over an hour later, TJ gave her the rundown of the ideas. And then it looks like you're about to tap, but, he explained, oh no, my mom would never talk to me again if it looked like I was about to tap. TJ and I looked at each other. If her mom wouldn't talk to her if she looked like she was going to tap, we would have a hard time selling her on actually tapping for the finale. Okay, we'll come back to that. I didn't feel the need to fight it. Whether it be a pin, a roll-up, or a submission, I was going to be walking out of there holding two championships in the air, having been the first woman to win the main event of WrestleMania. We left with one or two things nailed down, but the majority of the match was still up in the air. By the time I had driven the hour back to the hotel, I was filled with doubt about how good this match was going to be. With all of our busy schedules, it didn't look like we would have a moment to talk about it before the big day. Colby held me while every doubt and insecurity I'd ever had about wrestling and my ability gushed out of my mouth like a waterfall. It's not about the moves, he reminded me. The story is all there. You just have to tell it. He was right, of course. He had the best mind for wrestling of anyone I knew. And even though I was in the spot that he wanted, he wanted me to do my best and own it. But it felt so big, because it was. It could change the wrestling business for women forever. While the next few days were a blur of appearances, early morning media and late night shoots, I was grateful to come back to Colby every night and have that comfort. I'd never had that before, nor had I wanted that before. At first, I was even reluctant to share a room with him that week. I was used to my own way of doing things, which is to isolate myself, dwell, write, and concentrate on envisioning how I want everything to go. I viewed having someone else there as a distraction. Not him, though. He was the greatest addition to my life and the best decision I ever made. Episode 24, The Main Event The day that felt like it would never come was here, April 7th, 2019. This was my WrestleMania. I was the headliner. My name was on the marquee. 
This day would never happen again, and I didn't want to miss a thing. We arrived at MetLife Stadium before 10 a.m. It would be a long time before I'd go out. In recent years, WrestleMania had become upwards of eight hours long, including the pre-show. They had a tent set up with two rings, so we had a place to iron out our match. However, because everyone was so busy, we had to put the match together in small increments. We would come together, throw down a few ideas, and then be pulled away to do rehearsals or an appearance or try on our gear for the night. Rhonda had Joan Jett play her in, live, and Charlotte would arrive via a helicopter. I wouldn't have anything special, but that was also part of the appeal. I was raging against the machine. It would have been odd if they went all out on this for me. As I walked the hall on the way to the tent between obligations, I passed The Undertaker and Hulk Hogan. I'd watched both of them main event, and I was now in the same spot. Only I still felt like an excited kid, and I wondered if that's how they felt too. Maybe they didn't. Maybe it wasn't a big deal to them. Or maybe how big of a deal it was, was lost on them. Maybe not. All I knew was I had left my nerves in the hotel room. I was enjoying every minute of this day. The main show was about to start and we still didn't have our match planned out. Suddenly, a ref came in and put a new run sheet up. Colby, who was set to face Brock Lesnar, had gone from being right before me to the first match on the card. Shit! I gotta go watch this. I'll be back in a few. I ran out of the tent and up to Gorilla just in time to catch his entrance. Brock had arrived late and didn't like his spot on the card and thought their match would be better as the opener. What Brock Lesnar wants, Brock Lesnar gets. I knew Colby was meant to win the title from Brock that night, but wasn't sure if that had now changed also. Colby went out there, the star that he is, and took some gnarly bumps that had my heart jump into my mouth considering his back was still feeling awful, and I wondered if he'd even be able to walk tomorrow. I couldn't relax until the match was over. Eventually, as I watched through my hands, he hit the curb stomp, his finisher, and pinned the beast one, two, three, to become the new Universal Champion. I jumped up and down in my own little corner in Gorilla and waited for him to come back. Once I saw him walk through the curtain safely, I left Gorilla and stood just outside to allow him have his moments and thank everyone. Plus, we weren't officially out yet. He came out and wrapped me up in a big sweaty hug. I couldn't have done it without you, he said as camera crews swarmed us. Of course, he absolutely could have and would have. Even worse, he might have been the main event. Regardless, I felt special that I got to experience it all with him. But now that he was done, I had to finish putting my match together, get into my gear, and get my makeup done. It was just after 7 p.m., so I knew I would have at least four hours before we went out. By the time we had finished putting the match together, I was proud of what we had come up with. This could be match of the night, I said to Charlotte as we sat in one corner of the ring. Do you think? she asked. I do. I was genuinely proud of what we had put together. It was almost midnight when I stood in Gorilla, makeup on, gear looking exactly as I had imagined it. Fergal walked back after finishing his match. He too had just won the Intercontinental title. It felt like all my people were having their nights made tonight. Enjoy it, sis. Go get him, Fergal said as he walked past me. It was now time for the main event. The moment that felt like I had been building to my entire life. The women's roster had now congregated in Gorilla, I imagine watching with equal parts hope and envy. It was the spot everyone wanted. Bad reputation had just begun as Rhonda went to exit through the door that had replaced the standard curtain in Gorilla to the stage when the door fell with a giant thud on the ground, nearly crushing our star. I hope that's not a bad omen, I thought as Rhonda made her way to the ring. Joan Jett and the Blackhearts playing her down as the exhausted crowd came to life. The energy was clearly dwindling after so much wrestling. Then it was Charlotte's time. Let's kill it, I said as she walked out through the now gaping hole in Gorilla. Her music finished and I heard the sound of 80,000 people chanting my name, awaiting history. My music hit and I strutted out, ensuring I took my time to soak it up. The stadium was packed to the brim. The dark night sky was cold and crisp. 
I looked to the left to see Joan Jett kindly smiling at me as she touched her guitar. Walking down the ramp to the ring felt like it took two hours and two seconds at the same time as I tried to take in as many faces as I could. I looked out into the front row and immediately spotted my brother and dad. My dad, covered in a blanket to keep him from freezing, nodded at me with a warm smile on his face. My brother winked and smiled with a proudness about him. I wouldn't be doing any of this if it hadn't been for him. Usually, the friends and family of the performers get brought to the front row when their match is on. I looked for my mom, slightly nervous about how her and my dad would relate now, being in the same space for the first time in 20 years, but I couldn't see her anywhere. I'll find her later, I said to myself, while also being relieved that I didn't have to worry about any parental confrontations right now. The bell rang and the match started, the tired crowd graciously serenading me with the chance of Becky! Becky. Midway through the match, I was sensing it was too long, considering the hour and tomorrow was a school day after all. It wasn't going as smoothly as I had hoped for. It's true that the sound escapes in stadiums like that, but as a performer and as a human, I was aware that that crowd had now been there for nearly nine hours. We also hadn't taken into account that Rhonda had never done a triple threat, So some things that we knew from doing many of them, she wasn't aware of, such as rolling out of the ring and to the floor when you're not in a portion of the match. Eventually, we'd reached the crescendo. Charlotte was out of the picture, having gone through a table, and the crowd got riled up for the moment they had waited for. At last, it was Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey, one on one. We circled and then went in throwing fists before she cut me off to lead immediately to the finish, not giving them much of anything. She picked me up for one of her slams, but I rolled through to a pin. One, two, uh, three? She had picked her shoulder up off the mat before the three count. Whether that was by accident or deliberate, I suppose we'll never know. But the ref, knowing this was the end of the match, counted to three, regardless of Rhonda's shoulder coming up in one of the most anticlimactic finishes in WrestleMania main event history. We were making all sorts of history that night. Poor Spider even paid a $1,000 fine for his sin of counting to three when a shoulder had come up. Vince was strict on these things. The crowd jumped up to their feet regardless. They were happy to see me win in this historic match, but I'm sure also partially happy to get the hell home. All the people who got me to where I was flashing before my eyes as I crumpled over with disbelief. When I stood up, I saw my dad and brother clapping. Where was my mom? Why wasn't she there? She was supposed to have been brought down to the front. I saw my friends Jay and Jen. Maybe my mom was on another side of the ring. I surveyed the fringes of the crowd. I couldn't see her anywhere. My search was called off by fireworks going off to celebrate my win. I got fireworks. Soak it in, I repeated to myself. Am I soaking it in enough? Is this the right way to soak it in? No matter where you go, there you are. There will always be insecurities. There will always be doubts. But on this night, I had proved to myself, despite it all, I would find a way to overcome them. I got out of the ring and ran to my brother and dad. I'm proud of you, kid, Richie beamed. Well done, Bex, my dad said as I hugged him. I began to walk up the ramp, looking out to the crowd, afraid to even blink should I miss a second of this, the two titles I was holding becoming heavy on my shoulders. Tomorrow I would worry about what would come next for me, but for tonight, I was the man. I texted my mom when I got back to the changing room. Where were you? Why weren't you in front? The last time she'd seen me perform live in New York, I'd fallen flat on my face. Now, I was holding two titles in the air, doing what no woman in the history of wrestling had ever done before. No one came to get us, but that's okay. I'm so proud of you, my mom texts back. Even the man yearned for the approval of her mother and to put her mind at rest. All those gambles were worth it. Episode 25, The No-Sell. It was the Monday Night Raw right after WrestleMania, 
and I returned to Gorilla after my segment. What the fuck was that? Vince asked me. Uh, I'm sorry, sir? What do you mean? I responded, confused. I had just won the historic main event at WrestleMania, and Vince was making sure I knew how little that mattered, and I better not be getting too big for my britches. What did I tell you? Vince asked, turning it on me. To go down on the punch, I answered, it dawning on me why he was so upset at me. Then why the fuck did you know sell it? You fucked everything up. Sir, honestly, I didn't mean to no sell it. I thought I did sell it. I just didn't go down. I wasn't expecting it to land the way it did, and I was a little stunned. I explained my reasons, which once they came out of my mouth, I realized sounded like fabricated excuses. Do you fucking think I was born yesterday? Well, no, sir, I certainly don't think you were born yesterday. I had never been cussed at by him before. This was real top guy shit. But I was completely unprepared. And also, I was not in any way trying to fuck him, or anyone for that matter, over. We were less than 24 hours removed from WrestleMania. I was running on about an hour of sleep, having done media in the morning and had just delivered a promo with a new chantable catchphrase and future merch shirt. How about a thank you? Instead, Vince was very upset that I, who had just won both titles in the first woman's main event of WrestleMania in its history of 35 years, didn't sell the punch delivered to me by Lacey Evans, the brand new lady on the roster who had only been seen walking down the ramp in high heels, a dress and nice hats. Should I have been selling for her in this manner the night after such an occasion? Fuck no, but that's not why I didn't. She hits a punch to the jaw, which, though safe, can be a little jarring. And as this was my first time feeling it, I got a little rocked and instead of falling to the ground as one would with a cell, I caught myself from falling in the moment as was my natural reaction. I would chase after her and get the upper hand in the segment regardless, so there was no no selling necessary on my end anyway, considering I would overcome and conquer, which had been my path to the top thus far. Vince, however, could not be swayed from the fact that he had made me a top star, given me the keys to the castle, and now I was a big-time, arrogant asshole who thought I could get away with whatever I wanted, and no pleading with him could sway him otherwise. In fact, when I tried to explain myself, he yelled at me, You're not fucking listening to me! So many F-bombs. Shaken, I walked out of Gorilla and looked for solace in my friends backstage. Colby was right there to help me. You gotta understand, he's been burned so many times by people he's made stars. And plus, it's kind of a good thing. He thinks of you as a top star, as one of the guys. He'd never talk to a woman like that otherwise, Colby comforted me. But it hurt me that Vince thought I was doing it intentionally. In reality, Lacey should not have been my first opponent. She was brand new, green, and it would be my job to make her. As I was the champ, double champ, and someone who had just made momentous history, there should have been someone built up on the back end so that people would be excited about what I do next. But these were the creative oversights WWE had continued to make. What do I do? I asked Mark Carano, the head of talent relations. Look, you fucked up the spot. That's it. You tell him you fucked up the spot. But talk to him before he leaves. Otherwise, it's going to sit on you and him all week long, Mark advised. Okay, yeah, you're right. When should I talk to him? Wait till after the show. I'll be walking him out of here and I'll let you know so you can get him while he leaves. I camped outside of Gorilla waiting to pounce and occasionally being deterred as I'd confided in another confidant about the situation. Fuck him, don't bother. You know you didn't mean it. But perception is reality in this joint. As soon as the show was over, Mark gave me a nudge to let me know he'd be coming through and told me exactly where to stand so I could get Vince on his own. When I saw him rounding the corner, I pounced, his demeanor still indignant. Look, Vince, I'm really sorry. I mean it. I didn't intend to do that. I fucked up the spot. I'm sorry. I want to say it won't happen again, but shit, sometimes I fuck up. He immediately softened. I'm Irish too. I fuck up all the time. He laughed. I laughed too, nervously. 
He gave me a big hug that I didn't anticipate, but sure as hell appreciated. He gave me a rare glimpse into the human being who resides behind the skin of the mythical Mr. McMahon. The man who seemingly wants everything so controlled that he is perturbed by the act of sneezing, as it means he has lost momentary authority over his own body. We were cool again. And it was nice to know that even billionaire tycoons like Vince know they fuck up all the time but move on regardless. Not dwelling in the shit. Episode 26. The Intergender Tag. Seth says to Corbin, pick any ref you want. So he picks Lacey because she has a vendetta against you and tries to screw Seth out of the title. That's when you come out. What do you think? Ed Kosky, the head writer of Raw, pitched me on an idea. Gosh, I don't know. Is it weird for the man to have a man, you know? I wondered. Think about it, Ed said. Colby and I weren't even together six months. Our relationship hadn't been public for a month. Working together could be fun, but would it work? The way I see it, it's like seeing Daredevil and Elektra fighting side by side. If you know they're together, that's cool, but if not... It's no big deal, argued Colby. I suppose as a fan I'd want to see that, I answered. Exactly, and it'll be fun, Colby reiterated. I'm worried that they're just going to turn me into your girlfriend. Like that's what I'll be relegated to, I confessed. Nah, you're too big for that now, Colby comforted me. The summer months right after Mania and before SummerSlam can be a bit of a lull in WWE. Look at it this way. Mania is Christmas. There's so much build-up, anticipation, preparing. Then the big day comes, and you get all your presents, and then you move into the cold dreariness of January, where nothing much of significance happens. Joining forces with Kobe would either be exciting or ruinous, both from a career standpoint and a relationship standpoint. After much deliberation, and with the earth-shattering, excited love energy between us, we gave the creative team the all clear to go ahead with the storyline. But I had one condition that needed to be drilled into Vince's head. Becky can't just be Seth's girlfriend. Ha ha! Becky's not Seth's girlfriend. Seth is Becky's boyfriend. Ha 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 ha! Vince exclaimed, laughing in hysterics. It was all so nice in theory. Two of WWE's top stars, both champions, fighting side by side in the face of evil. We made our side by side debut at the Money in the Bank pay per view and quickly found out that, in reality, it was a damn mess and not in the slightest bit cool. Commentary reminded the good folks watching every two minutes that Becky and Seth are in a real life relationship, so much so that it was both uncomfortable and off putting. We also had no idea how to interact with each other on screen. I was used to being a badass. He was too. And in this mushy, muddled TV relationship, we were just plain awkward. Or, more appropriately, I was plain awkward. Or cringe, as was often the word used to describe it online. Blending the two worlds didn't work for me, as I was two completely different people in each of them. In the ring, I said what I meant, didn't take any shit from anyone, needed no one and showed no level of vulnerability or humility at home or with colby rather i needed no mask he was very aware of the insecure strange often shy girl i was who would struggle to say how i feel or speak up he knew all of my vulnerabilities for better or worse he knew i was not the person on screen unless i was pissed off then the man would be scared of rebecca quinn When the storyline was over, I think everyone was relieved. Him, me, the audience. Colby and I learned a lot about ourselves and each other in that short time. We hadn't been dating long, but we were thrown into the deep end. Even if we weren't a good pairing on screen, I had found the perfect person for me off screen. Two months after the TV storyline had ended at the Extreme Rules pay-per-view, and after us having our first tag match together, which despite the awful storyline, was actually a great match. We took our first vacation together to Hawaii. On our second day on Maui, we got lost on the way back from a day trip and stumbled across a beautiful secluded beach. 
No one was there, only the sun grifting behind the cliffs, the sound of the ocean crashing against the shore, the odd bird chirping in song. I was taking photos of Colby as he was looking at the sunset, his jacked back and sleek tattoo a more beautiful sight than the picturesque scenery. All of a sudden, he pivoted and dropped to a knee. I stopped snapping as my jaw hit the sand below. Will you marry me? He asked. What? Is this real? Yes, he said. Yes, yes, of course, I exclaimed, happier than ever. As if by magic, a lady with a professional camera showed up a minute later. Kobe hadn't planned any of this, but when we came across the ideal scenario, he figured it was perfect, and the magic lady took my iPhone and angled us into the best lighting. As we got unlost and found our way back to the hotel, I texted everyone I knew to tell them the good news. There was no shame, no worry, no doubt. As a friend, I'd never thought Colby would be the marrying type, but two months into dating, he was already calling me his wife. We never really discussed marriage. It was more of a foregone conclusion that we would be together forever. My mom didn't stop talking to me for three weeks when I told her. In fact, she was over the moon. When you know, you really do know. Episode 27. Give me a hell yeah. Things were rolling at lightning speed. In the space of a year, every wrestling dream I had ever had was coming true. I was put on the cover of the WWE video game, the first time ever for a woman. I was on the cover of magazines, even becoming the first wrestler on the cover of ESPN, the magazine. I did sports center commercials. I went for a week straight sleeping only on airplanes because I had so many appearances literally all over the world. I got to work with The Rock. John Cena, Edge, fill him with Stone Cold Steve Austin. I was on Billions on Showtime. I filmed with Marvel. I got a book deal. Hi. I became the longest running Raw Women's Champion in history. I bought my first house. I had great matches. I had awful matches. I had underrated matches. I had mediocre matches. I was getting to travel the world and work side by side with my best friend and now fiance and paid to do it. Life was a series of ups with the odd down and little time to process anything or even be aware of what was happening. However, I now had many voices in my head and my ear offering different advice. Some voices were more dominant than others, with some ideas that were better than others. It was my job to navigate between all the noise. I was the man after all. But sometimes I fought the wrong creative battles and listened to the wrong people. I got worked up over insignificant promos or outcomes, approaching everything as if it were do or die. I felt the need to conform to what I'd been doing on social media, i.e. being an asshole, leaving me feeling not so great about myself, like I hadn't been true to myself. And to use the quote from the beginning of the book that my dad had always repeated to me, which he misquoted from the Bible, but I like his version better. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will complete you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will destroy you. I loved my work. I hated how worked up I would get it every single week of television or over every single creative direction. As if the wrong story would send me back to the pit of irrelevancy from whence I came. I'd worked so hard to be the first woman to main event WrestleMania and send the business in a different trajectory. But once I had reached the top of the mountain, the first question was, what next? The company came and offered me a somewhat lofty contract. But now that I had achieved my ultimate goal, I wondered if it was time to think about my next goal. One outside of the confines of the ropes. Being a mother. I had badly wanted a family one day. I had found my perfect partner. In work, I was becoming increasingly more anxious, worrying about my booking. Having reached the top of the mountain didn't mean I could enjoy everything more. It meant I was concerned about staying at the top. And I'm positive I was a pain in the ass for the creative team. It's so cliched that it's all about the journey and not the destination. But it was true. The destination was only the beginning of a new journey. But while I was worried about what was going to happen next, 
all of a sudden, the world shut down. We were supposed to fly out to Canada when we got word of the global shutdown because of COVID-19. Is the show still on? I asked the travel department. Yes, for now. Just take the flight anyway. But what if we get stuck in Canada? It was March 2020, and you couldn't sit down to get coffee anywhere. But in WWE, the show must always go on. Vince was the first person to put a show on after 9-11. He has run shows after the tragic passing of co-workers. He loves wrestling more than anything but also truly believes that wrestling is the distraction people need during hard times, such as a global pandemic. So unless the government made him cancel, those shows were going to run. The government did indeed make him cancel that show, and many to follow, but they couldn't stop him running a TV show on a closed set in front of no one. And that's what we did. All of our travel was changed to Orlando, to the Performance Center, where I'd trained for all of those years. In the classic never-say-die Vince McMahon way, the show carried on as we hurtled towards WrestleMania. After all, this global shutdown couldn't last more than two weeks, could it? No way. Even two weeks seemed like an eternity. Do you think we're going to have to cancel WrestleMania? I asked Paul Heyman. I think you're looking at the venue for it, he responded nonchalantly. This? PC mania? No way. You think it's going to last that long? October at the earliest before we have fans back, he prophesied. I walked away shaking my head, thinking what an alarmist he was. There was no way it could last that long. This wasn't any Raw, though. This was the return of Stone Cold Steve Austin on 316 Day, so called after his famous King of the Ring promo, where he notoriously said, Austin 316 just whooped your ass, leading to a global phenomenon and the best-selling t-shirt in wrestling history. Stone Cold Steve Austin, in the PC, drinking beers and giving the finger to no one, seemed so very weird. All of this felt weird. Just a week earlier, we were wrestling in front of 15,000 screaming fans in Washington, D.C., Now it was us in our bodies, bereft of adrenaline, taking bumps to no reaction, but still with the duty of entertaining millions of confined viewers the world over. I had pitched doing something with Steve because we'd been compared so much, and it was a hard and fast no. That was up until 10 minutes before we went out for the main event segment of the show. Even though there was no one in attendance, we still went live because that was the only system we had in place. A rider came and grabbed me. Hey, we might need you to come out and drink with Steve if we go under time. Well, shit, that's cool. Would have been nice to have planned something earlier, but sure. Okay, great. There'll be a cooler full of beers waiting at Gorilla. Bring that down and you guys can cheers or whatever. I stood behind the curtain, watching Austin, the coolest wrestler to ever lace up a pair of boots, in the midst of an awkward segment. That even seems weird to say. An oxymoron, if you will. Austin and awkward are just not two words that go together. It was simply so un-Austin-y. No people, him holding cue cards, bantering back and forth with Byron Saxon. This shit was weird. And it was about to get a whole lot weirder when my music hit. Down I walked, cooler in hand. We cheered. We stunned Byron Saxon too many times. We accidentally kicked him in the dick too many times, drank too many beers because the music kept playing and there was nothing else to do. By the time the segment was over, I was suitably shit-faced. The company had never filmed a Raw in front of no one, and I had never gotten drunk live on TV, but here we were. The year 2020 was wild in all the worst ways, and it was about to get even wilder. Post-Raw, and in the throes of drunken passion, Colby and I took less caution than usual. Even though I did want to be a mother, I was still the champion, and I fully envisioned it would take an eternity to become pregnant. Even though I was only 33, considering the damage I had done to my body over the course of nearly 20 years, between taking bumps and eating disorders, I figured there was no way in hell that my insides would be working properly. Oh boy, was I wrong. 
When we returned home from filming WrestleMania at the PC two weeks later, I was already feeling nauseous. No, it couldn't have happened that quickly, could it? Holy shit, but what if it had? There won't be any fans for months. What will I be missing? If ever there was a time to be pregnant, this is it. But then again, what if I lose all my momentum? Everything I have worked for could all come crashing down. This has never been done before. How will Vince react? How will the fans react? How will my mom react? Out of wedlock and all that jazz. Only one way to find out. Take the damn test, Rebecca. I bought one of those early response tests. Six days earlier, it said. I peed on the stick. The control line showed up immediately. But not the second line. The you're pregnant line. Without waiting the full time, I threw it in the bin because I was so certain I was not pregnant. Off I went to the gym, still nauseous as a sailor. When I came back, I noticed the stick again. Only this time, there was a second line. Oh shit, don't read after 10 minutes, the box said. But that's a second line. I could swear that's a second line. I showed Colby. Oh shit, that's a second line. Right? But it says don't read after 10 minutes. When did you do this? Before the gym. Did you not read the instructions? You know I'm not an instruction reader. Well, fuck. Do another one. So I did. Another faint line. I think that's positive. It's very faint. I texted Rachel the next day, showing her. It looks negative, she said. Don't be disappointed. It usually takes a long time. But I feel it. I feel like shit. Might just be your period. My sister was trying for a full year. I'm getting a goddamn digital test. Life hack. Always go for the digital test. I went into the pharmacy to pick up the test. The man behind the counter offering me a good look as I walked out, box in hand. After I actually read the instructions, Colby and I camped out in the bathroom, waiting for the little digital window to inform us of our fate. Those three minutes felt like we were waiting the entire duration of Schindler's List. Pregnant! Colby read out as he threw his arms up in the air, proud of his seed. Yes! Holy shit! Yes! But also, no! What if I'm not actually ready? I'm not ready! Now all those questions were real. What will Vince say? I asked, while simultaneously arguing that I shouldn't have to care. I was a woman and had a right to become a mother. Sure, it wasn't ideal that I was currently the champion, the men in our industry don't have to skip over the important part of life choice that is starting a family. Why should I have to? Apart from obvious reasons of the time away. But this was a new world, and these things should be taken into consideration. For better or worse, I was going to be the crash test dummy. Could women in wrestling have it all? Colby sent his mom a picture of me with the test. She rang immediately and went as far as to start opening up her closet, showing all the baby clothes she had already purchased in anticipation for this day. Damn, Holly, we ain't even been together that long. I thought I had more time. That's why these are the only things I have, she said as she pulled out an entire wardrobe for a newborn. Oh man, I'm about to be someone's mom. We did the rounds. We called Colby's dad. We called my mom. We called my dad. The dads cried. Our lives were about to change forever. Episode 28. Take a walk. The tears streamed down my face. I'm not saying this. This is the biggest announcement of my life and I'm not going to have two old men tell me how I'm going to say it. We agreed on this weeks ago. Why the hell has this all changed? Why is no one listening to me? The doe-eyed rider looked back at me. I'm sorry, I don't think you have to say it exactly as is. What the fuck is the sword of Damocles and why the fuck would I be talking about it now? And why am I starting a fight with Charlie? Or anyone for that matter? Charlie was our backstage interviewer. I, uh, well you don't, it's, it's not what we agreed on. I'm pretty sure I was turning crimson while I ugly cried, yelled, and rained spit drops all over the poor writer who was trying to console me. This was the epitome of my difficult-to-work-with era, 
only now amplified by the multitude of hormones circulating in my body. There is a custom in the backstage politics of professional wrestling where you must maintain your best poker face at all times. Emoting is seen as a sign of weakness, and this business is survival of the fittest. Ironically, beyond the curtain, the opposite is true. The best wrestlers are the ones who emote authentically, who allow the audience to feel what they feel. They sell, i.e. react to something in such a way that makes it appear believable and legitimate to the audience, usually referring to the physical side of wrestling. But it stretches far beyond that. We're selling stories, characters, hopes, dreams, and most importantly, merch. Okay, maybe it's not most important, but in the eyes of the company, it's pretty darn important. Anyway, back to my meltdown. Vince is almost done. Go in there as soon as Jamie's out. On most days, even though I had built a good relationship with Vince McMahon, there was still always a nervous anticipation of approaching his door to ask for something. Today, however, was no ordinary day. I had no filter, no restraint, and absolutely no couth whatsoever. There was no deep breath or blessing myself to protect myself against his ability to mind control before I knocked on the door. In fact, I didn't even knock on the door. I kicked that mother down, metaphorically speaking, of course. Clearly, I had enough rage on my face that our director of creative at the time, Paul Heyman, gathered his papers and bolted out of there as quick as he could. I'd long since hypothesized that pregnancy was accompanied by a free pass for bad behavior. And on this occasion, my theory had been proved correct. I was only nine weeks pregnant, but I was bad to the bone. Vince, still miraculously delighted about the fact that his current longest reigning women's champion and arguably biggest star was leaving to go have a child, was oblivious to the fury I had brought into his office as he greeted me with a welcoming hug that ended up tears soaking his fancy Armani blazer. What's wrong? he asked, finally reading the room. What came out of my mouth next was barely comprehensible, but between sobs I managed to get out, I uh, don't uh, want uh, to uh, do this. Uh, no one uh, is uh, listening to uh, me. Uh. What are you talking about? Calm down now here a second. What don't you want to do? Vince consoled me like a grandpa. I composed myself for long enough to explain why I didn't want to go out and start a fight with Charlie, who was simply interviewing me, and then pick a fight with Oscar, who, unbeknownst to her, would become the next Raw Women's Champion. I was the man and all, but I wasn't a dumbass pregnant lady who would pick fights for no reason. He listened before asking, What do you want to do? I want to go out there with the title and the Money in the Bank briefcase and talk about how much this has meant to me, but say I need to go away for a while. Then Oscar comes out screaming at me looking for a contract. I tell her that I put a lock on the case and that she hadn't just won the chance at the title. She had won much more. She opens it. Then I say, now you go be a warrior because I'm going to go be a mother. Well, that's much better. Why don't we do that? Really? I was now sobbing because of how nice he was being. No one told me this idea. It's great. Let's go do it now, Vince said with a warmth that tends not to be associated with the mythical billionaire. I had somehow managed to keep my makeup intact in the midst of my breakdown, and Vince guided me to the empty warehouse to give my farewell speech in front of nothing but a camera and a skeleton crew. Such was the COVID-era way. It was a long way from where I started. I'd left my family years ago to make this dream work. Now I was leaving my dream work make a family. The announcement was received with overwhelming positivity. Of course, there was the odd, how irresponsible comment here and there, but hey, go fuck yourselves. I knew the timing was perfect, as if I'd been guided by the universe, but the daunting reality that now I'd be sitting at home by myself several days a week with a growing belly and hormones aplenty was sending me into a deep anxiety. I'm not the world's best at doing nothing. But if nothing else, I'd be doing nothing with the rest of the planet. Except maybe I tried to write this book. Episode 29. I am the mom. 
The week before I was due, I got unearthly terrified. I am not ready. Everyone would ask me, how are you feeling? Are you excited? I'd respond with an, oh my God, I can't wait. While inside I was trembling with fear. What if I didn't bond with her? What if I got postpartum depression? I tend to veer on the side of the depressive as it is. On a rare day off from the gym, Colby and I sat down in his coffee shop and were relaxing as we watched a couple of young girls play on the couches there. We're going to have one of those. I know, I responded with a hint of anxiety. Not a moment later, the phone rang. Hi, is this Rebecca? It is. Hi, this is Dr. Jones. Hi, Doc, what's up? We tested your liver enzymes and they've become elevated. You have what we call cholestasis, so we're going to bring you in to induce you. I grabbed Colby's arm as he was mouthing, Who is that? What's going on? As I clearly had a terrified look on my face. The doctor continued, Because if it passes through the placenta, it will stop the baby's heart. Seeing as you're 39 weeks, it really is best to just get her out now. I quickly responded, Oh, shit, okay, we'll head right there, before telling Colby, We have to go have the baby now. They're going to induce me. Panicked, he loudly replied, No, what? No, what's happening? No, we have to. Actually, Doc, could you just explain this to my husband? We weren't married yet, but fiancé is such a fluffy word. One minute later, he hung up the phone. We're going to have a baby! Ah! I guess I wasn't the only one who was nervous, though I was now visibly shaking. The reality that life would never be the same again had come. We rushed home and got our bags for our stay at the hospital. People had told me to eat as much as I could before getting to the hospital because once I was there, I couldn't eat. I stood at the kitchen counter shoveling leftover pad thai into my mouth, my whole body quaking in fear, my appetite non-existent, forcing the food down regardless, though swallowing felt like throwing up in reverse. The next time we'd be coming home, we'd have our little girl with us. I was in labor for 24 hours without pain medication and was now puking and spasming uncontrollably from the pain. Though I think the most painful experience of the whole thing was the annoying high-pitched nurse telling me, each contraction is bringing you closer to meeting your baby. Shut up, bitch, I'm puking over here. What if I don't like this baby? It sounds cold and heartless, but I'm 98% sure that plenty of women have felt the same way on the brink of giving birth. Going from someone's child to someone's parent in one fell swoop. I had told myself, that if I could get through this without an epidural, I would be able to do anything else in life that I wanted. I would have the will and determination and fortitude to achieve anything, for I am the creator of life, the fortress of pain, the willer of wills, or something like that. Point is, I hadn't had a challenge in a while, and I was getting pretty damn bored chilling at home. The Pitocin swam through my veins, never letting the agony break for a split second. The sensation was compounded temporarily by the loud crunch of chips and the ratchet smell of salsa as Colby dug into a snack. A serpent's tongue temporarily popped out of my mouth as I hissed, Go away. What's that, honey? He replied lovingly. Go away, please. Huh? He sounded befuddled. My head felt too heavy to even look up. The chips. Go away. Just go away, please. He put the crinkling bag away as he sighed. I'm so hungry. I was passing the threshold. Shit was happening. You know, movies give a real bad indication of labor. I thought the pushing part was the hard part. But as soon as I had the urge, I felt like a release. Like finally my body was working with me and not against me. Sure, the guttural sounds that came from me were like something you'd hear on Animal Planet. But it wasn't painful. After I had been pushing for five minutes, the doctor informed me the baby's heart rate was dropping. We have to get this baby out now, she directed me firmly, yet shockingly calmly. I was done waiting for contractions to push. I bore down and pushed that child out with every fiber of my being. Only she wasn't crying. Why wasn't she crying? I'd never been more scared in my life. 
After spending nine months wondering if I would bond with this baby, I was immediately ready to die for her. The nurse had a cloth over the baby's mouth as they hit her on the back. She can't breathe, I yelled at the nurse, moving the cloth away from my baby's nose and mouth, completely forgetting how umbilical cords work. Thirty of the longest seconds of my life later, I was calmed as with one final whack to her back, she started the most adorable, most amazing little whimper I had ever heard. My little baby girl was here. She was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen and I loved her with every cell in my body. Nothing would ever be more important to me than her. We named her Rue. I thought that was such a cool name. But when she cried, she looked like a little grumpy old lady. She looked more like an Agnes than a Rue. Still, we called her Rue. I couldn't believe that this most perfect baby, who, by the way, I had no idea how to look after, was mine to keep. Two days later, we went home. My perfect little family. Episode 30. The Submission. Should I kick off the mortal coil? There is no point in you even trying to come back, as, actually, I won't be here and there certainly won't be much crack in these queer times. Dad. And so, at 4am, I lay in bed in Los Angeles, my iPad on my chest, and watched as my brother carried my dad's coffin into the funeral home in Limerick. I had to be careful not to wake the three-month-old laying next to me. Ten people max, six feet apart, masked up. This was his send-off. Twenty fucking twenty-one. No crack indeed. And then Rue started crying. That makes two of us, baby. His health had gone down rapidly, or at least that's what he had let on. He never wanted me to worry. He didn't tell me that the cancer had returned, or that he had passed out in the doctor's office, or that he had become so swollen that his clothes had to be cut off of him. After all, I was a new mother and had enough to be worrying about. Every time he called, I was short, talking about how stressed I was, the lack of sleep I was getting. I had nothing but time and the luxury of being at home with my beautiful, healthy baby. Why the fuck was I acting like this? Why did I become so self-centered that I neglected to call him back for three weeks or get around to it, I thought. When I finally did, I was complaining about how tough I was finding it, how stressed out of my mind I was. Enjoy it, Missy. That's all the advice he could give me. I became mad at him for brushing me off like it could just be that easy. I can't enjoy it, Dad. I'm so stressed. I don't have any help. She won't sleep. I don't know how I'm going to go back to work. It's an adventure, Missy. Enjoy the journey. Now I get it. I get that he was on his way out and he wanted me to enjoy this part of my life. Every part of my life, really. Especially that which was his favorite part of life. Being a parent. Richie was the good kid. The one who looked after him always. I could provide the money. Richie provided the things that were priceless. Care, affection, time. Richie suggested that we do a FaceTime so that Dad could see his granddaughter. That was the last time I saw him. He looked skinny and frail. His arm was in a sling. He said he fell. I knew things weren't quite right, but not for a second did I think. I'll never see my dad alive again. I just chatted and played with Rue till the conversation had run its course and we hung up, not thinking anything of it until Richie said, He's not doing too well. Would you think of coming home? I got stressed again. There were two-week quarantine procedures. There were no direct flights and hardly any going into Ireland at all. How would I figure all of this out and with a three-month-old and a fiancé who was on the road? How long do you think he has? I don't know. It could be six weeks. He didn't even have six days. I tried to talk to him every day after that, his voice becoming increasingly more fragile his mind unable to comprehend the things I was saying, not yet admitting he was exiting the world. It was a Monday four days later when me and my dad had our last conversation. I'm on my way out, Bex. I know, Dad, I said as I broke down in tears. 
I did weird things. I played nervously with a makeup brush. I cradled the teddy bear he gave me. I ran downstairs, half-dressed, looking for Colby's hand to hold. I scrolled my phone, looking for a way to record the phone call so that I could still have my dad's voice to listen to, all while he was talking. I'm sorry, Dad. I know I was trouble. I know I wasn't a good daughter. You were always a joy, Bex. How could he forgive me? He was dying and I hadn't even returned his calls. He was dying and all I could talk about was myself. He truly loved me unconditionally. I wish I could be there, Dad. I should have been there when Rue was born. But you couldn't, Dad. I know. I love you, Dad. I love you, Bex. Richie took the phone from him. He lost his ability to talk the next day. The day after that, he was gone. He never got to meet Rue. He would have adored her. He would have loved her uniqueness. How she knows exactly what she wants and will not be dissuaded. He might see expressions that remind him of me, but he'd know that she is an individual and he'd encourage her originality. In the pain of loss and the crippling guilt I've felt since, I still write messages to his phone as if he's here, updating him on Rue, telling him all of my worries that he'd never judged me for. It makes me feel like he's not really gone. He's just back in Ireland and I haven't seen him in a while. Like he's getting back at me for not returning his calls by not writing back. It's hard to know what to say when someone dies. Always there with the wisdom of a sage and knowing the perfect thing to say. The Rock, whom my dad always loved watching when he was wrestling, and who had become a good friend and confidant to me in recent years, offered the most comforting perspective. In his signature voice, kind and compassionate, he gave me the greatest amount of comfort in one sentence. And now, he's always with you. And now, he's always with me. Episode 31 And New I was en route to LA eight months after I had had brew when Vince McMahon called me. What would a comeback look like at SummerSlam? Well, damn, I don't know. You just call me. What are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking you show up and cost Charlotte the title and then go away again. What's the story behind it? There is none. Just a one-off and then we don't see you again until the draft. I was insulted. They'd originally told me I was coming back at SummerSlam. Then they changed their minds and told me I wouldn't be returning until October. Now they had changed their minds again. I had plans to make, a baby to take care of. Can you give me the night to think about it? Of course, of course. As soon as I got off the phone, I told Colby, this fucking guy, and started to explain the phone call. To my surprise, he responded, <laughs> I kind of like it. Just the idea of you fucking someone over and then disappearing sounds like something Austin would do. You think? Like they don't have any sort of plan. Feels like it's just a waste of my return. Nah, man, it's not your real return. With an outside perspective, I thought about it, let it simmer and went to sleep, getting pretty excited about being in the mix again. Let's fucking go. Only to wake up to a text from Vince the following morning saying, I've changed my mind, but be ready. Well, that's disappointing. I'd come around to the idea. But don't worry, I stay ready, I replied. I had done all the in-ring training, gotten in the best shape of my life, but at least I had more time to prepare. Only a day later, on a Saturday, Colby, who was doing live events, texted me to say, Sasha's out. She was set to face Bianca for the SmackDown women's title. SummerSlam was only a week away. I was going to get the call that they needed me. Sunday came. No call. Monday came. No call. Bring, bring. Hello? Hi, Becky. It was Bruce Pritchard, the creative director of Raw and SmackDown. Hi, Bruce. How's it going? He asked. Going good. What's up? I responded, knowing exactly what was up. Well, we have a bit of a problem. Oh, yeah? Sasha might be out for SummerSlam, Bruce started. I heard that was a possibility. And you gotta give them the match or give them something bigger. 
Not that this would necessarily be a bigger match, but the element of surprise made it most intriguing. So what are you thinking? Well, Bianca comes out, says, Sasha can't make it. We go to a two-on-one match with Carmella and Zelina. She beats them. Then you come out and beat her quick. You win the championship and we turn you heel. Then we don't go back to you and Bianca till Mania. Ooh, that would make her a huge baby face. I like that. That's option A. What's option B, I asked. Option B is you interfere in the Raw title match and cost Charlotte the title. Then we don't see you till the draft. So you're saying either way you need me for SummerSlam. We need you for SummerSlam. All right, see you there. Thanks, Becky. But now, shit, who is going to look after Rue? With such short notice, we had no nanny situated. We had discussed our friend Jen, but she was going to SummerSlam as a fan and was excited about her first big event. I didn't even know what I'd need for this damn comeback. New gear? I didn't have any of that. Thank God I had dyed my hair a week earlier. Turning heel was a huge move for me. I'd spent the entirety of my career in WWE as a babyface. The one time they tried to turn me into a heel, I became an even bigger babyface. But this was different. It might work this time. Because I was given so much before I left to have Rue, the online crowd was already beginning to turn on me as a babyface. And if I screwed over someone they genuinely cared for, like Bianca, someone who was new and exciting, and the crowd was genuinely behind and happy for the push she was getting, it would be the most dastardly thing I could do. And I was excited to try out a new character, one that was the exact opposite of the man. By Friday night, I still wasn't sure what I was doing. Communication was minimal out of both uncertainty and trying to keep this a big secret. Thankfully, being the angel that Jen is, she said she would miss the show to help us out, relieving my greatest source of anxiety. At around noon on Saturday afternoon, Johnny Ace, now head of talent relations, and Bruce came to see me on my and Colby's tour bus that we had recently acquired. There was no way we could travel 52 weeks a year, different town every night with an infant without one. Bruce, Johnny, and I chatted formally amid the chaos of what was about to be everyday life on the bus. Important business meetings going on while Rue scooted around the floor, cooing and crying, Jen picking up toys, Colby cooking food, and our bus driver Andy pottering about looking for things to fix lest he be still for a single second. Sasha was out and I was in. It turned out they had a little problem with their original idea. They had forgotten to book Zelina on the pay-per-view. So instead of it being a two-on-one match, it would just be Bianca versus Carmella. I would then come out, beat up Carmella and throw her out of the ring and into the steps, cut a promo challenging Bianca to a title match that would blow the roof off the place and then beat her lickety-split. Roof started. Vince just wants one thing. Well, I can do that, I responded, relieved that I wouldn't have to have a full match right away with someone I had never worked with. Johnny added, So you go to shake her hand, punch her in the throat, and then one thing. What would that be? Probably a rock bottom. Sounds great. We'll tell Bianca and get her in here soon so you can go over it with her. What about Carmella? Does she know? No, we're going to tell her in Gorilla, trying to keep this as secret as possible. I get Kayfabe, but not telling a performer what was going to happen was pure fuckery. And the last thing I wanted to do was put Carmella, whom I adore and respect, in that position. I texted her right away. Hey, I know they're trying to kayfabe you on this, but your match doesn't actually happen. I come out and they want me hitting a few things on you and throwing you into the stairs. I am so sorry. She knew that likely my return was happening. She's a great worker and didn't mind that being her role. But understandably, she did not appreciate being kept in the dark by the office. She did, however, appreciate the heads up, so at least she wasn't blindsided in Gorilla. I felt guilty that my return put her in that position, though. A new feeling to add to the already bubbling melting pot of emotions. Anxiety, excitement, doubt, apprehension, suspense, you name it, I felt it. Bianca came in to see me a few hours later. The chaos of the bus was now amplified as we had added a hair and makeup person, 
Megan to the equation. Rue constantly trying to take brushes out of Megan's hand as soon as she came near my face. I got up as Bianca came in the door. She gave me a huge hug as she smiled and welcomed me back. I didn't really know her, having only met her a handful of times, but she could not have been more gracious. We'll make you a huge baby face out of this. Thank you so much for being so cool, I told her, trying to ease her mind of any potential fuckery on my end. I know how it goes. I'm just excited I get to be a big part of this moment. I knew she was being honest. I can also imagine she is not an android and was also extremely disappointed. She'd been doing a fantastic job as champion. It was my goal to make sure she got her moment back in a big way at WrestleMania. It could have been easy for her to bitch and cry about being buried, to be mean to me and not want to work with me, and it all would have been understandable. She was nothing but pure class and tact and deserved her next championship to be even bigger. I retreated from the chaos in the front of the bus to the back bedroom and made a call to the rock to make sure it was okay that I used the rock bottom, not wanting to just straight up thieve his finishing move. Never mind he's the most successful movie star on the planet, he's also like Batman. If you need him, he's there in a flash. Of course, he said in his wonderful way of saying everything that he has ever said. This is your moment. Take it in. And when the time's right, I want you to look into the camera and say, I'm back. Just that. He's the freaking best. It was almost showtime. I fed Rue one more time and handed her off to Jen, ready to do the damn thing. I was rushed past everyone in Gorilla, including John Cena, Triple H and Stephanie, who all gave me big smiles and stood at the curtain waiting for my music to hit. All the thoughts were going through my mind, like, what if they don't remember me? And what if it's not that big of a pop? My worries vanished almost right away when my music hit and the crowd cheered like we were still good buds, sending a shockwave of gratitude down my spine. I was too happy and excited to act cool, to use Triple H's term that he used with me years earlier. I was on excitement crack. Once I kicked Carmella out of the ring, which, by the way, didn't get much of a pop, mostly because I imagined to most people she didn't deserve it and it was mean-spirited to the woman who had shown up to cover up the absence of another. It was game on. The crowd became electric, feeling the intensity of what was about to unfold. This wasn't the match they were prepared for, but by God was it the match they wanted now. I soaked up all of their excitement and love for one final second, knowing that in about one minute they were going to despise me. Alas, old pals, I thought, it's been a good run, but I've done all I can as your friend. It is time for me to see what I can do as your foe. We had a little bit of good sportsmanship with a handshake, then BAM! Right in the kisser. Slam! Right on her back. One, two, three. And no! Smackdown Women's Champion, Becky Lynch! The air was sucked out of the arena. The pop had faded to booze, or mostly shock and confusion. What the hell just happened? Did they just squash Bianca? Why? How? My heel turn had begun. People were genuinely angry. It was going to be hard for someone who had been a fan favor to all of a sudden be a bad guy. But if they felt that the machine was behind me, that I didn't give a fuck about anyone else and wanted to keep my spot by any means, then they would surely be mad. And they were big mad. When I came back, I saw Bianca crying. Understandably. She felt like her momentum had been killed. Not that she would sell it, though. She's a real-life champion and passed it off as being happy for me. I tried to reassure her that I would do right by her, but she didn't know me and had no reason to believe me. I would have to prove it to her. As I made my way through the sea of wrestlers and colleagues whom I hadn't seen in nearly two years, welcoming me back and offering hugs, I was eager to find my baby, show her my new title. Look what mama did, as if she'd give a shit. This was my new reality, the perfect blend of the thing I love and the people I love most. Instead of going out to dinner to celebrate my comeback, 
or hanging out with my friends, talking shop and making jokes. I popped a frozen meal in the microwave and ate it while nursing my child. Then it was time to give her a bath and put her to bed. I couldn't imagine a better way to celebrate or a better way to live my life from here on out. Epilogue, The Dark Match. What followed SummerSlam in 2021 and into 2022 is what I consider my favorite year in wrestling. As a heel, I finally felt the freedom to do what I want, to say what I want, to not take myself too seriously or have to answer to anyone's expectations. I had a new perspective on life and work. I was there to build my opponent and tell the best story I could and hopefully take an entertaining ass kicking while I was at it. Wrestling is my art and I'm damn good at it. Even if I'm not the most technically proficient artist in the world, my body is my paintbrush, the ring is my canvas and the moves are my paint. Within there are my opponents, different strokes with different folks but it's all art and whatever the onlooker thinks of it is up to them. But for me, I just want a body of work and a portfolio I am proud of. Even though I was back to being on the road four days a week, every week of the year, I had my new little family with me the whole time. Sure, it meant dragging a tiny baby to Saudi Arabia and back again twice or to and from the UK several times and on planes several times a week. It meant not sleeping through the night one single night all year, or sometimes not sleeping at all the night before big pay-per-views. I was juiced up on all the love I could handle. At home, the audience mostly hated me, or at least played along. Twitter is where the real hostility happens, where avatars in droves told me how awful I was. I might hate me too. What with my beautiful little baby, hot-ass husband and dream job, life has been fucking good. Of course, it was not without its hiccups. I fractured my goddamn trachea. Mine and Charlotte's heated rivalry reached the boiling point when we had one of the shittiest segments in SmackDown history, when during a title exchange, I felt she deliberately went off script, leading to me yelling in Gorilla that she was a, to use my exact words, crafty fucking cunt right in front of Vince and a plethora of onlookers and her denying it was intentional emphatically. And yeah, Sasha and Naomi walked out of Raw right as it went on air when we were meant to be the main event that night, leading to a whole bunch of chaos. But they had their reasons and that is their book to write. Vince suddenly retired from the company after being all I'd ever known of WWE and in many ways is responsible for the life I have now and my lovely little family. I was able to have my dream match with my teenage hero and friend Lita in Saudi Arabia, where once women weren't allowed to have matches at all. Bianca and I were able to pay off her quick loss by stealing the damn show, if I do say so myself, at WrestleMania 38 in Dallas, the same place I had my first WrestleMania match six years earlier, and I got to give her her championship back. Ultimately, our feud continued to SummerSlam that year, where I would finally turn back babyface, but also separate my shoulder, which in a weird way was a blessing. And my little girl has been there to see it all, oblivious to her unique way of life. I get to be her constant. When everything around us is shifting, through never-ending airports and hotels, living on buses and in different cities every night, her mama is always there to put her to bed at night, to comfort her when she wakes up. I have learned many things on my journey, many of which are your usual cliches. That it's always about the journey and not the destination. That change is always possible and things are only impossible until someone does them. That nothing outside of ourselves can bring lasting happiness. More than anything, I have learned that my biggest enemy has always been self-doubt and that when I have been able to free myself from its irritating shackles and have the courage to trust my inner compass, wonderful things can happen. I had never considered myself successful, always striving to do more, be more, chase more. That hamster wheel had become pretty exhausting until I realized 
I have everything I wished for since I was a kid. My family, my dream job, my friends. For the girl who was always so average in every aspect of life, average height, average weight, average anxieties, average grades, average upbringing, I've gotten to do some most unaverage things. I am not your average, average girl. Becky Lynch, The Man, Not Your Average, Average Girl, was written by Rebecca Quinn and read by the author. It was recorded by Scott Crisp and Peter Straub at 48 Windows in Santa Monica, California, and by Travis Harms and Robin Charlin at Oakwood Studios in Geneseo, Illinois. Post-production by Common Mode, Paul Fowley, Technical Director. Credits mixed by Terry Hogan. The associate producer was Hana Matsudaira. Becky Lynch, The Man, was produced by Tiffany Ferrari and directed by Aaron Larson. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Becky Lynch, The Man, is available in print from Gallery Books.